Hello everyone and welcome to Millennial Rewind, where we take a not-so-sentimental look at the movies and TV shows that were around when millennials were growing up. I'm your host, Nick, coming to you from the death-by-sex capital of the world, Los Angeles, California. And joining me here in the City of Angels is my co-host, Jules Jules. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm planning a bank robbery. All I need is a genius hacker, an experimental military helicopter, and a satellite dish. It's great that you keep things simple. It really is. (laughs) And joining us from the corpse hidden in a closet of Southern California, the Inland Empire, is my other co-host, John. John, what's happening? I am invincible! (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad we got that out of the way early. Uh, I even wore my round glasses. It's going to come around again. (laughs) You are dressed the part. We'll get there. And that other voice you heard, as you might have guessed, we do have a guest joining us today, coming to you from a city that you rarely notice because it is, in fact, a stealth helicopter, Vancouver, British Columbia. We have Rob Boffard. Rob is an author who writes under the pen name Jackson Ford. He holds the prestigious title of being our first ever guest, as well as the dubious distinction of being our first ever return guest. Rob, welcome back. The stealth helicopter of the Pacific Northwest. I like it. I like that a lot. I'm going to start using that. That's good. It's great to be here, guys. Thank you for having me. Oh, man, I have a lot to say about the helicopter in this movie when we get there. (laughs) (laughs) All right, but before we get started, if you like what you hear today, please do us a favor and hit that subscribe button. Also, be sure to share the show with anyone you think might like to listen as well. So, we watched the 1995 James Bond film, GoldenEye. It was the first outing for Pierce Brosnan in that role. And John, how would you tell somebody you watched GoldenEye without using the title? Well, we've said this a lot, and it's been 26 years. Can we put this to bed? Odd Jobs Cheating. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he's yes, right yes he fucking right. is no, yes no he fucking it. is truth and jules if the producers had asked you to come up with a different title for this film what would it be well i was wondering whether i should sing it i think i will actually from russia with sex strangle <laughs> <laughs> But she's technically from Georgia. Yeah. Never mind. I'm being pedantic. <laughs> let, let him have it. Just let him have it. I'm going to let him have when it. When he mentions she's from Georgia, she's like, oh, you've been to Russia? So I mean, it fits. Russia, Georgia, same thing. And Rob, what character in Goldeneye would you recast and who would you replace them with? So there's this random CIA agent in this film called Jack Wade, played by Joe Don Baker. And he's fine, but I, can't, I, I, I kind of wanted to put Denzel Washington in that role and see what would happen. He wouldn't have taken it because he was too big at the time, but I don't know. I feel like he would have stolen every single scene he was in. (laughs) He would have. I I was worried you were going to say Eddie Murphy again, (laughs) but Eddie Murphy in every different movie. (laughs) Now, Eddie Murphy in a James Bond movie. I mean, it would put butts in seats. Let's be real. Absolutely. Oh, my God. As a CIA agent putting on all the different disguises (laughs) (laughs) and being different characters. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. So... Golden Eye, yeah, as I was saying, first James Bond film with Pierce Brosnan. What are your guys' experiences with it? Once again, Rob, you're going to you know, keep me honest vis-a-vis yes, what I say, because you know we were both in South Africa at this point in our lives. Although I do remember it coming out like 96-ish. It was not 95 for sure. That's correct. That was, yeah, it came I was out still 90, in America. And I de- in SA. Yeah, I definitely watched it in South Africa. Uh, yeah, so Rob, since you're our guest, why don't you tell us about your experiences with GoldenEye? So GoldenEye is quite special to me because it was the very first James Bond film I actually saw. I think there was a gap of about four or five years between Living Daylights, which was the last Timothy Dalton film. that came out in like 91 or 92 and, um, and GoldenEye. And so when GoldenEye came out, I think I was about 11 or 12 and from my dad, who was a massive James Bond fan, that was like, my son is now old enough to watch James Bond. There is a new James Bond out. We shall go and watch Goldeneye. So although I'm sure we're going to tear this film to shreds on this episode. Oh, we are. It deserves to be torn to shreds. 
it's still what? got a place in my heart because like that's a memory with my dad and it's the first James Bond film I ever saw. Like to me, Pierce Brosnan is and always will be James Bond. You never forget your first. You know, I, I, I absolutely enough. second that. That's almost identical to my experience. My dad's a huge Ian yeah. Fleming fan. He has all the original books. He's uh, And this was the first James Bond I saw in the movie theater and also happens to be the first James Bond that wasn't written by Ian Fleming. <laughs> and yes, it's Pierce Brosnan, even though he's, He's not the best James Bond, still feels like James Bond to me just because I saw him first. <laughs> True that, man. John, how about you? Uh, somewhat similar. I found out about James Bond because of this movie. And my mom was really excited because, um, well, she still does have a thing for Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> like, she was upset when Timothy Dalton got the gig. <laughs> Wow. But yeah, so she was super excited that Pierce Brosnan was James Bond. I was like, who the hell is James Bond? And so then my dad introduced me to the Connery and Moore films. And so I got to see some before this came out. I had a little bit of exposure beforehand. Got it. So apparently I'm the only one with pre-Brosnan Bond experience because we had all the sh- like all the Sean Connery Bonds on VHS, including Thunderball, the worst Sean Connery <laughs> James Bond, essentially off. Oh, I forget. It's the one where essentially it was Thunderball remix, the one that he made in the 80s. It was terrible. We had that one. So I had seen basically all the Sean Connery James Bond. So I was excited as a James Bond fan going into it. And I enjoyed it for the most part. I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, I thought it was bullshit that he did nothing with his car because that was one of the things that I really liked about the Sean Connery Bonds. It's like, oh, his car did cool stuff and had cool gadgets. And he just kind of drives around in this one despite the fact that we know it's got spy stuff in it yeah yeah they point out the special features that it has and they're just not utilized at all exactly no. where, are my, where are my stinger missiles man where are my stinger missiles through the headlights they're yeah. behind the headlights and that's where they stay that's their place keep them there i honestly feel like it was a trick that the screenwriter was pulling like making you think there was going to be a car chase with this car and then at some point just threw the tank chase scene in <laughs> like... i got a lot to say about this tank chase scene <laughs> oh yes oh yes i only have two things to say about the tank chase scene. i do think we have to acknowledge one thing this is my personal opinion not sure if it's shared by others, but I feel like this movie was overshadowed by the incredible video game that came out on the N64. It was such a mm. phenomenon when I was growing up. It lasted for years and years. It was always something friends would come over and play. Everyone had their expert area with grenade launches in the basement and or proximity mines in the temple or something like that. I was about to say, no, no, it was proximity mines and temple. That was that the, was the one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That was a complete no, no, guess. Listen, I, I, actually, I actually can confirm just how much of an impact this had on, on Jules's life because I used to play go over to his house all the time when I lived in the UK and we'd play, we'd play Goldman on the N64. Yeah. And when I first moved to the UK as an adult, I hadn't seen Jules in about 10 years. And I phoned him up and said, do you want to come around and have a drink? He brought his N64 with Goldeneye <laughs> that he still had. And then we played Goldeneye. It was fantastic. It was great. Man, N64s in South Africa, I feel, were super duper rare. Yeah, I don't think never anybody them. had them, so I only ever got to play it on trips to America to see friends and family. So if a family friend or a family member had it, I got to play it a little bit, but I feel like I didn't get as much golden eye as other Americans of our generation, and that is that is tragic. I'm just going to throw that out It's there. a classic game, man. Still I never up. had an N64 either, so I never got to play it that much. So despite what I mentioned earlier about cheating, I was so bad at the game that I was encouraged to use and play as Odd Job just to help level out <laughs> like the playing field and give me a bit of a handicap. That is how shit I was at this so- game. <laughs> wow. So for you, Odd Job is not cheating. <laughs> It allows me to stay in the game a little bit longer. (laughs) So notice how we're talking so much more about this video (laughs) game (laughs) than the movie. (laughs) And I think, you know, when we actually get into it, you'll find out why, audience. This movie does not hold up that well. Ooh. Oh, I no. still love this. I shit still enjoyed out of it. it. Yeah, it was fun. It doesn't hold up, but I still enjoyed it. Yeah, it, it is fun. <laughs> it's got some goofy things. There's stuff that does not fly today that's still like fun to laugh at because it's ridiculous in our modern context. Yeah, and so as we were kind of talking about before we started recording, this was directed by Martin Campbell, 
who went on to direct Casino Royale. So he rebooted the Bond franchise twice. And he also did uh, The Mask of Zorro, which took me by surprise. Yeah, The Mask of Zorro, Legend of Zorro, and eventually Green Lantern. Uh Uh-oh. And Vertical Limit. Don't forget that one. Vertical Limit. I I can't believe I forgot Vertical Limit. (laughs) (laughs) But you remember Green Lantern? (laughs) I don't know. I I never claim to make sense. All right. Well, uh, why don't we take a break? And when we come back, we'll start breaking down Goldeneye. You wanted to see me? Uh, Yes, I did. Uh, Please take a seat over there. Bond. James Bond. Yes, I know. I sent you the email calling you here into HR. Bond, we've had numerous sexual harassment complaints filed against you. Oh, nothing but misunderstandings. Uh, no, no, they weren't. They're, they're all very serious. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Miss Moneypenny, who says that you've been making unwanted passes at her for years now. She loves it. She flirts back. It's our thing. Yes, she says she did that because she was afraid of what she might do if she didn't. <sighs> Nonsense. Money, pen, and the eye are something. There's something between us. All right, and then there's Jessica and Analysis, who says you repeatedly pointed both of your hands at your genitals and insisted she, to quote her, analyze this. Well, if she had actually taken a look, I would have found out about my herpes sooner. Okay, good to know that. And finally, there's Margaret the intern, who says you like to wear a French maid outfit, drop a feather duster in front of her, and pick it up suggestively. I'm sorry, I seem to have dropped my pen. Nope, nope, just leave that there. Don't. Okay, uh, you know what? Uh, in light of all of this, we're firing you. You're, you're fired. <laughs> You can't fire me. I am the greatest secret agent at MI6. Uh, No, not really. There are plenty of double O's who save the world on a regular basis and manage to do so without being a sexual predator. Fine. Then I will take my herpes elsewhere, and it will be a fun place with blackjack and hookers. All right. Well, you have fun with that. (laughs) God... And we're back, and again, because I always have to comment on the logo, dat MGM logo, the roaring lion Uh right in the middle of it. Yeah, and their only successful movie property that they still have is James Bond. (laughs) Literally nothing else. And so we get the classic James Bond intro, which is, you know, he's walking in a white space being followed by a gun barrel, and he turns and shoots the cameraman and then the red blood goes down and we you know immediately go into the start of the movie what the fuck is this music i was about to say this lounge lizard ass music but it's really soft and like overly synth like it's not what i remembered at all i was expecting your classic like big loud brass band you know for the theme and this is not it i like the music I mean, it's. I've seen it a million times after playing Goldeneye a million times, and I still think it's cool. The only thing was, though, is that as a kid, I didn't realize it was a gun barrel. I thought he was just shooting a guy with a telescope. <laughs> I don't think you're the only one. I think that mm. it, I, I might have had that mistake as well, because as children, maybe you shouldn't have intimate firearms knowledge, rif- you know, rifling in a gun barrel. I don't know. But yeah, this. I'm sorry, but this music is trash. The only acceptable song during the sequence is the yeah classic james bond theme uh so we open up on a plane flying over a dam and my first note here is god 90s film stock is really starting to show its age and it really shows in this shot so definitely not pierce brosnan runs through a gate (laughs) (laughs) the hiding of the stunt doubles is uh, a is something that does not happen no it does not happen it's just like don't look directly at the camera no one will know the difference exactly but here's yeah so he runs somebody's nice enough to open this gate for him this automatic gate just opens letting him in and there's no guards it's so weird right so yeah. weird. there is literally no one around this is supposed to be a you know top secret facility so definitely not pierce brosnan runs right into the middle of this dam because it'll be a lot more cinematic when he does his eventual bungee jump 
And they really shouldn't be showing this much of not Pierce Brosnan's face as he's getting <laughs> right ready to jump because he's kind yeah. of looking up and you look down and you're like, those eyebrows, man, those are not yeah. Pierce Brosnan's. We actually do see the uh, the stunt double who did this stunt later on. He's the one who gets shot by Xenia. He's the helicopter pilot who gets shot by Xenia. Oh, really? shit. That's I mean, yeah. it makes sense. The eyebrows match. The eyebrows match. <laughs> But I, I have to say, this is a hell of a stunt, though. Oh, it's, it's, it's actually, I think, it's considered the highest distance jumped of any stunt in movie history, I think. Something like that. Oh, I believe that. At least at the time it was. But man, this bungee jump would be so much more cool if I wasn't so aware that this isn't Pierce This is Brosnan. not Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> to highlight something that was good about this scene, though, I mean, other than cool bungee jump, I really thought the sound design for this scene was incredible. Like when he gets to the bottom of the jump and fires the grappling hook. There was something about the sound and the way it was recorded. I was just like, damn, that's actually really fucking good. That's like, that's held up. I actually agree. But then later on, the sound gets a bit off. Right. Oh, yeah. I'll find it out when we get there. Yeah, we're going to get there. Explosion sounds <laughs> later in this movie. I'm like, two different sound designers worked on this, clearly. Yeah, the, some, <laughs> I think you're The right. sound effects in this movie are definitely a weak point overall. But back to the bungee jump real quick. <laughs> Um, yep. So this dam is in Switzerland. Okay. And it became a popular bungee jumping site due to this movie. I can believe that. And wound up like on the Amazing Race and stuff. This dam is also featured in the climax of Doom 3. What? The video game? This is spelled <laughs> D-H-O-O-M. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Sorry, is this a movie you're talking about? Yes, the this whom? is a Bollywood movie about Indian cops stopping a circus performer trained in magic from robbing Chicago banks. This conversation is a wild ride. <laughs> wow. I need to watch this. This is movie one of those now. sentences that makes Nick have a stroke if he were to say it. <laughs> Yeah, My I mean, God. there's a reason why I'm not really talking that much right now. I'm trying to recover cerebrally here. Yeah, the Doom series from uh, yeah from India. <laughs> so, yeah, at the bottom, he uses this grapple gun to kind of pull himself down. And we get a super that tells us that this is a chemical weapons factory in the Soviet Union. Switzerland. And, <clears throat> yeah, in Soviet Switzerland. And Bond cuts open a metal slab with a laser gun, but somehow doesn't blind himself. I'm pretty sure nope. he needed some welding goggles <laughs> to do It was do the this eyebrows, safely. man. They felt they fell down and... <laughs> <laughs> So then we're in a Soviet bathroom and some guys try to take a shit and, you know, guys got his newspaper as is tradition in, you know, 20th century shits. And I, I because I speak a bit of Russian, I translated one of the, the headlines in this newspaper. And I think, Jules, you'll appreciate this. It says, 50 years ago, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union sent the first Soviet footballer to play for a foreign club. Seriously? That is seriously what the headline <laughs> says. I was just respecting the shit out of the fact that this bathroom had pegs on the wall so you could hang your coat while you went to go pee. That's nice. Yeah, because there's another guy in there as he's walking out. Like, he's not really in uniform, but, like, he takes his jacket off of a peg on his way out. They take care of their stuff, you know? Like, good working conditions. They want to retain But they don't people. bother to clean the bathroom, so... <laughs> not really. That it's I would not want to go in this bathroom. That is not in Soviet budget. <laughs> Coat hooks for everyone. No washing. <laughs> so James Bond drops in on this guy who's trying to take a shit, like waits for him to pull his newspaper down just so he can quip at him. <laughs> okay. I loved this and subsequently hate it. Yeah. Me too, because actually. this sets the tone yeah. for this James Bond. And there are so many missed opportunities for quips in this movie. So he says, beg your pardon, forgot to knock, and he literally beats the shit out of him. Yep. Then he does some sneaky sneaky, um, ends up in like a refrigeration room next to the mess hall, and 006 jumps out, loudly yells in Russian, attracts all of the guards to their location. <laughs> They're captured, and the movie's over. It was weird. I don't remember this movie being that short. Yeah, for some reason, Ned Stark, who's undercover, points a gun right at his face, can clearly see his face, and doesn't confirm until after the code name is is said. It, it makes absolutely no sense why he did that. I don't know if it was the transfer to digital or what, but Sean Bean's face is not well hidden in this. When he's in the dark, you can still totally tell it's him. Kind of, yeah. And this happens later when it's supposed to be the surprise reveal. You can absolutely tell. Like, you can make out his face still in the darkness. 
He's got a very distinctive shaped face to Sean. He's got a very Sean Beanish face. He does. <laughs> if there was a way to describe Sean Bean's face, it would absolutely be Sean Bean. It's true. Yeah. Yep. Did, did you guys also notice the casual butcher that was in this chemical weapons plant? Yeah, they've got a full butcher and a baker and a candle. It's weird. You know shipwrecks in there. Yo, you know <laughs> shipwrecks in there. <laughs> I, I like the fact that like you saw the canteen, though, and the soldiers in the canteen, because it made the base or the facility they're infiltrating feel like a real place. And when yeah. all the guards showed up with the guns, you're like, well, obviously we saw them there already. So yeah, this exactly. is not a surprise. So I think this is kind of a big deal because he's like, you know, hello there, 006. 006 is Sean Bean. I'm just going to call him Sean Bean. Of course. Yep. He's Sean Bean. Um, And I think this is a big deal because I am not aware of James Bond ever working with another 00 before. It's just kind of like James Bond goes out into the world and James Bonds the shit out of it. But Oh, it's been mentioned yeah, a few times the, the, about the being a 006 and a 008, I think it was mentioned at one point. In the books, at least. But right. as far as like actually having... Um, actually working yeah, together yeah, a mission together yeah. yeah actually having a mission together yeah so they, they they kind of say their their little like buddy phrase to each other sean bean who has got like the poshest accent like sean bean is like from manchester or some northern city he does not sound like this in real life They're like for england james for england alec you know <laughs> just <laughs> posh as posh can be and so they sneaky sneak into a chemical lab. They kill the scientist because fuck him. Because fuck science. <laughs> Fucking science. No, man. we aren't starting that shit now. <laughs> Way too much of that around. <laughs> and this music is terrible that plays throughout the <laughs> sequence. And it sounds like it belongs in the original Wolfenstein game. It's just so bad. Most of the music, like there's a point where like it gets better, but it is bad mostly throughout. Um, so they're, they're going to hack into a doorway to get into this this main warehouse. And it's really great that the device that these spies use to open doors makes really loud beep sounds. Mm -hmm. Everything know? they use makes loud beep sounds. Yeah, it's really good for stealth. Well, that's why they killed everyone along the way. So they, exactly, because they don't want them to hear it. They killed everyone with their silent guns so that they wouldn't hear these slight beep noises. Uh, so now they're in a warehouse, got a lot of vats, aluminum barrels and stuff. and. There's a line here uh, from Sean. He's like, half of everything is luck, James. What's the other half? The alarm goes off. Fate. Luck and fate are the same fucking thing. Yeah, it made no like, sense at all. And the alarm goes off because he puts the password decoder back in the keypad, like on the other side of the door. Why? To lock it? Like, what the fuck was that yeah, supposed to do? Yeah, he was trying to lock them in. I didn't get that either. Or maybe he knew that it was going to set the alarm off because he's not who he says he is. And so he was trying to set what? the alarm off on purpose. Possibly. Or more likely, the screenwriters were like, well, we have to insert this luck fate thing somewhere. This sounds like a good plot to do. What would cause the alarm to go off? Him punching in the keypad. Fine, let's just do that. All Fine. right. We need, yep. to get the, we need to keep this movie going. So they run down to some of the vats. Bond places a bomb buddy, and he sets the timer for six minutes. This That's is right. going to be a, a thing throughout the movie. Guards appear with Colonel Uramov, uh, and they start shooting away at the bulletproof glass because they've locked themselves in, and they are standing way the fuck too close to this bulletproof glass. But before, right? before that happens, <laughs> right. uh, Trevelyan shoots a couple of the guards through the door that they apparently locked. Uh, one of the guards yeah. falls down the stairs, so he's going to have to call oh one one eight nine nine but no um that's gonna happen a lot by the way people falling downstairs is a very common theme um but was that was that an it crowd joke yes, yes. that was yes. very ah, much an I IT got it. Crowd. And, yes. that is, and it was not the first time it's been brought up on this podcast <laughs> Oh, I'm in the right place. What I want to bring up is that since they'd already, two of those guards had shown that they could get through that door, why did they have to shoot out the bulletproof glass as opposed to just walking like two feet over the door? I would say door? so that they could all come in at once instead of being bottlenecked through the door, where protagonist gunfire could just take them all out. Possibly. Yeah. But they stood way too close. Like so, so many of them would have died from ricochets, I feel. Hey everybody, this is Nick just jumping in here real quick. We had some technical difficulties. A big chunk of Jules' audio just didn't record for some reason, so he's going to be a little quiet for a bit. Uh, don't worry, he comes back in later in the episode, so don't miss him too much. Just letting you know. Anyways, back to the show. 
so anyways, they get in. Uh, Sean Bean hip fires his AK-74U because that's how action guys do it. Uh, Bond continues to plant bombs and all of a sudden like, like, it gets really quiet. It's like he doesn't hear anything and he calls out to Alec and it turns out that, uh-oh, he's been taken prisoner. Uh, Bond immediately surrenders and then one of the guards puts a bullet in his head and again, the movie ended really freaking quickly. Like it was so weird. <laughs> Like, I, I remember there being, like, a whole tank chase later. It was weird. Uh, no, that doesn't really happen. But uh, Alec is killed, pin in that. Uh, seems like a weird ruse. Why not just help the Soviets kill him and then not have this other guy fucking with his plan? I don't, it seems kind of contrived. In a Bond movie? I know, contrivance <laughs> in a right. James Bond movie. <laughs> Speaking of contrive, Oromov then gives him 10 seconds to surrender. He also says, hold your fire about five times in the sequence. <laughs> well, this gives Bond enough time to reach over to the bomb and hit the magic cut half the time off button. That Yes, <laughs> that he does. So he has three minutes and then he gets behind a dolly full of... Danger stuff. Danger barrels. <laughs> and, <laughs> they're not and, red, though. It's weird. I mean, they're, I assume they they're supposed to explode if you them. shoot them, but they're not red. It was it was, it was, was a nice moment. Like, I'm saying, this, it's yeah. not ter- a completely terrible movie. There are some great moments. This is one of those good moments of tension. And then you have the damn rookie who can't control himself and has to shoot his gun. Yep. He shoots his gun, and then the colonel shoots him in the head, and then... No one remarks about this at all. So James Bond starts a conveyor belt, and then as he's, like, flying out, he shoots this grated storage area, opens this grate, and it just sends barrels of stuff flying down onto these soldiers i will give up all my money if i found out they didn't use just like empty soda cans dropping it on the floor for these sound (laughs) effects this scene was mad though because they're not i mean obviously james bond is planting the bombs on the racks of these barrels or soda cans or whatever they were (laughs) but they also have this additional upper level barrel storage Uh that he suddenly explained why (laughs) my my thought was more of this movie why (laughs) (laughs) oh yes everything in this movie is explosive except the script acting concepts yeah tight plot that's not tight anyway so bond is outside again and again why is the music so bad here it's It's terrible oh my god synth (laughs) trumpets that want to play the theme song but they're like a little too shy not allowed to They're just not allowed to. There's a shootout on this runway. This is like a runway where that plane we saw earlier landed. It's trying to take off. And Bond manages to close like a 150 meter gap just on foot with this plane without getting shot. He's just Or caught ex- by motorcycles. Or caught by motorcycles. <laughs> He literally chases down a plane on foot, jumps aboard, and fights the pilot. Yeah, he chucks the pilot out, and at this point, some motorcycles have gotten up, which are, by the way, these are Kagiva Motorcycles, an Italian company that was definitely not commercially available in the Soviet (laughs) Union in the mid-fucking 80s, okay? This is some bullshit. Well spotted. Wow. Nick's our expert for this sort of thing, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've only just gotten started. I like how one of the motorcycles punts the pilot. <laughs> yes, it does. He starts to get up and does that like, ah, scream. And the motorcycle hits him and he goes fucking flying. I think they scored a point on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a GTA. They got some points for that. So James Bond is on a motorcycle and he's going over the cliff to get to this now pilotless yes. airplane. And this is where Orobov is like, wait, wait. Why? Shoot the motherfucker. He's exposed. You have like 90 dudes. If you all open fire on him, one of you's going to hit him, and that's the end of James Bond. Oromov already recognizes that he's the protagonist, and it just won't work. Oh, there, there's like 90 times in this movie where <laughs> the movie would have just ended had somebody shot him. Yeah, it's 50, it's 50% luck, 50% fate. So he goes over the ridge. The plane has gone over the ridge. The and he manages to somehow skydive into the plane. Skydive into the plane and pull up just in time. With the help of one of my favorite characters in the movie, amazing blue screen backgrounds. Yes. Yep. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, yes. 
they had five dollars for the blue screen effects in this this is a 50 million dollar movie they dedicated five dollars to the blue screen <laughs> no they dedicated four dollars and then spent the remaining dollar on the music that was their music <laughs> <laughs> So when the plane dives and comes back, I think this could make it on the bingo card where if it's a hang glider or a plane or whatever homemade contraption where like they fall off something high and there's something in the foreground that kind of blocks it without fail, you can go one, two, three, and up. There they come. Now yep. they have Every time. reascended. Yeah, it's the one, two, three up. No, I just want one director to like have them die. Crash the plane. And he's like, <laughs> oh shit, he went there. Uh, so James Bond flies away. However, they now know that there was a British Secret Service infiltrating the Soviet Union, blowing up one of their facilities, and World War III started. And this became like a really weird nuclear holocaust movie i again did not remember this i remember it being you know kind of this is world war four uh world war three was started in top gun (laughs) (laughs) now we get a classic james bond credit sequence you know it's like hot babes doing hot babe things sprinkle with soviet imagery get sickle stars lenin statues smoke this is a tina turner performance not a tina turner song that is true because who wrote the song, guys? The, the better half of you two, or, <laughs> yeah. or the more popular half, at least. Bono yeah. the Edge. Bono wrote the Golden Eye song. Bono and Bono Edge. Yeah. And the oh Edge my god! Both wrote the. It's Golden in Eye song. the credits, man. Come on. <laughs> Missed that one. Damn. But the but Tina Turner does knock it out the park. Oh yeah. I will give that to her. Yes. She crushes it. She absolutely does. Yep. Hey, when since Die Another Day by Madonna exists, it's really hard to make a shitty Bond song. <laughs> relative to that (laughs) so now we have uh, bond driving his old aston martin through the mountains of monte carlo nine years later uh scaring the shit out of this lady who's been sent by mi6 to evaluate him Uh, i don't know what she's supposed to be evaluating him on his ability to drive through french countryside i would presume his mental state because she starts bringing psychology into this (laughs) While they're zooming through these mountains, notices a Ferrari behind him while 70s porn music plays. Naturally. <laughs> but again, in that sort of like 90s synth vibe, I yeah, the music still sucks. This is the it's worst. It's still really bad. This is the worst car race chase music ever. This is Famkia Jansen who played Jean Grey in the X-Men movies. And fuck, she is hot in this movie. Oh, my God. Um, So they start a race. Famke Jansen cheats. She drives across, like, a part of the hill to get ahead and barely misses a tractor pulling hay, and she starts spinning out. And I'm just going to go ahead and pretend I didn't see that stunt driver in a wig. I'm just going <laughs> to pretend. That that but it was, it was an excellent stunt, though. To keep a car spinning like that so many times was very well done. Mm. I'm just saying they did not have hide the stuntman budget in this film. I'm surprised they didn't use, reuse eyebrow guy. <laughs> it might have been. They, they was fell into spinning too fast. And so the evaluation lady is like, you're just trying to show off the size of your, and James Bond says, engine. And she says, ego. They're talking about his dick. Again, from James Bond? <laughs> There was a previous movie with a character named Pussy Galore. Yeah, this movie, like, it's trying to, like, pay, like, you know, stay true to the the older James Bonds, but it's trying to do its own thing and take it into the next century that's coming up, and it just, it, it hadn't found the balance yet. And so they apparently encounter the Tour de France. <laughs> <laughs> right i was very disappointed by the lack of fruit cart in this scene but they did hit the group of cyclists so right so they know. literally stop famkia jansen drives her ferrari like in front of james bond in the other lane and they're just standing still and literally one of them kind of back pedals in place <laughs> yeah. and this causes him to fall over and just domino the rest of the fucking and there's one guy who didn't fall over and i like to think that he was just like well fuck it and just kept on trudging <laughs> up the off. hill and left them all behind. Uh, they are not paying me enough as an extra to uh, risk injury, so uh, fuck you. 
I, I thought I thought the bike thing with the them all falling over was and not getting hit by the cars was quite clever. That was a nice little kind of subversion of expectations. I like that. I expected them to at least get clipped. Well, the fact that they fell over anyway. Listen, the body count in this movie is already through the fucking roof. I was like, what, you know, why stop there, guys? Well, it's not like she'd lose sleep over it. She would ruin the seat if she did that from how wet she got. But we'll get to that. <laughs> oh, that's a nasty image. Ooh, we, yeah. So evaluation lady, redhead, not particularly like James Bond's normal level of hotness. She's actually kind of like very plain. So she insists on the him stopping the car. He stops the car. And no sooner has he pulled the fucking handbrake up, he leans over her chair and he says, as you can see, I don't have a problem with female authority. Pops open a champagne cooler. But before you see it's a champagne cooler, she looks down like he just got hard. Like noticeably hard. She looks down, she's like, holy shit. And then you see that it's a bottle of champagne. And she goes from being terrified and clearly despising Bond to turned on in 0.1 seconds. Mm -hmm. Because they just start making out the fucking Aston Martin. Crazy. Uh, So that evening, Bond drops his car off with the valet at the casino. He uses the French he learned as a child from the kids tapes on his way over <laughs> like we're supposed to be impressed that he can speak french where he's like hey how are you you good yeah. i'm good great <laughs> like that's it très bien monsieur bon no où est la biblioteca la plume uh, de ma tante he notices however that uh famke jansen's ferrari's there goes inside the casino and what is this fucking lethargic string music <laughs> Playing over this whole sequence, I God, I almost went to sleep. This is supposed to be like a sexy, flirtatious baccarat game between him and Famke Jansen, and it's just like uh, sleepy. Here's a tidbit for you guys: the musical director for this film is a guy named Eric Serra, he's French, and he's a frequent collaborator of Luc Besson. I think oh, he's wow. the musical version of Luc huh. Besson's movies. <laughs> She's smoking a cigar, and I think there was less demonization of cigars than there was cigarettes at this point. Like this is the, this is where like smoking is starting mm-hmm. to get banned from airplanes. They're starting to get rid of it. For, like this is smoking getting more and more marginalized in society. She's a villain, the so she's allowed to smoke. But you know, that's a thing. yeah. Only bad guys can smoke from now on. Yeah. Well, so they have this baccarat because again, they're they're trying to play all the James Bond greatest. It's like, look, he's got his Aston Martin. Look, he gambles in obscure French micronations. And after some flirtatious talk over some Baccarat, he eventually beats Famke Jansen, and to which she screams, Bliach. And as somebody who speaks... What, what was she saying? What was she saying then? Nothing in Russian. Do you know why? This is not a fucking word. I know the word she was trying to say, and she fails this fucking word throughout yeah. the movie, and as somebody who speaks Russian, this... Yeah, she's supposed to be going, ah, fuck, basically. W- what is the word? Bliach. Bliach. But she goes, Bliach. Yeah, I don't know why there's the... Ch- at the end of it. Yeah, I don't know. You just lost, you just lost a lot of money in Baccarat and you try to say blia and also bitch at the same time and it just comes out as bliach. Son of a bitch. <laughs> anyway, so they, there's some more post-game flirting and I'm not writing down all these fucking quips and double entendres. Um, he orders the James Bond martini because we're playing all the greatest hits here on James Bond FM and he also does the famous Bond James Bond introduction to which she says that her name is Zinya on a top. <laughs> Again, the series had someone named Pussy Galore. <laughs> yeah. At one point. They, this is the series where like later on they named a character Christmas Jones just so they could make Do the, the joke. joke at the oh, end. Jesus. God, I thought Christmas only comes once a year because they're having sex. I'd forgotten about Christmas Jones. That was special. Well, that was trying to convince us that Denise Richards could be a nuclear physicist. <laughs> <laughs> I barely believed she was a pilot in Starship Troopers. I barely believed she could act. <laughs> Anyways, back to this movie. Um, so Can we just go back to the other one? <laughs> <laughs> comments on her Georgian accent also kind of calls out the fact that her fake plates on her Ferrari. They're too fake. They're Yeah, they're too fake because even the, the counterfeit ones start with L on that kind of Ferrari. And she asks him what he, rank he is at the Department of Motor Vehicles, to which he says, Commander. To which I said, foreign DMVs have ranks? Yes, I am the <laughs> Commodore of the DMV. <laughs> but then the response is, this dude I'm with is an admiral. Yeah, some like dude who comes out of nowhere 
Yeah, who is an admiral. <laughs> yes, yeah, the, the naval rank of the DMV. <laughs> <laughs> Lord Commander Admiral of the Department of Motor Vehicles. What the fuck? The DMV uses navy ranks. <laughs> My only response is this, is this is the dumbest exchange I've ever heard in a movie, ever. <laughs> How did this make it through to the final cut? How? And to which he responds to her, I like a woman who enjoys pulling rank. He's got this like weird, wah, like dumb wah. sub thing. Cause women, have, who the fuck knows? Anyways, outside Lady Gaga is doing a weird mime show at an amphitheater. Yeah. So while this like weird Lady Gaga mime thing is going on, uh, he goes to a vantage point nearby and he sees on a top going with this admiral on a ship. He gets the name of the boat the yacht that they're going to and also notices a helicopter on a nearby destroyer pin in that apparently his 1995 camera has wi-fi because by the time he gets back to his car it prints out physically prints out like a full intel report on the ship and who she is in color no less Mm. in color yeah like within five minutes well yeah it, it has a thing about like money penny had done the the research and you and you hear her saying everything that the is written on the printout yeah she leaves him a voicemail <laughs> on top of like pulling all this info like she's pulling an all-nighter clearly so yeah on a top is a former soviet fighter pilot suspected to be part of this uh, crime ring based out of saint petersburg called the janice group and no contact is authorized with her unless it's cleared by m yeah that ship sailed yeah i think that's that's what they were getting and now we get to the infamous sex scene from this film. Famkia Jansen on a top is a big fan of the violent sex. And guys, I just want to put it out there. I'm okay with Famkia Jansen killing me with violent sex. I am okay with it. There's something Famke to Jansen, it. There's me. definitely something to it. <laughs> so much scratching. And she <laughs> yeah. gets into it. Like her performance oh. is like, you went for this. Respect. The dude kind of starts freaking out and everything. But when you see his dead body earlier he has the biggest grin on his face <laughs> yes. i was gonna mention that he yeah. wound up loving it at the end right because she's essentially squeezing his lungs with her thighs and mm-hmm. preventing him from breathing which is how she kills him and also she enjoys the act of killing that heightens her sexual experience rob so correct me if i'm wrong here when i was growing up in south africa we were everybody was talking about these scenes us elementary school kids who got to watch this movie we referred to what she did to this dude as saffing is that it's been years since i've heard that but yes that is 100 percent. that is 100 percent correct okay yeah that is that is the slang she was saffing this guy yeah yeah literally fucking him to death yeah okay and so here's the thing somebody is stealing his id card out of his jacket while she's fucking (laughs) him to death and it's like dude you are all part of this conspiracy you could wait until she's done (laughs) you don't need to come in there while this is happening maybe she likes being watched maybe this is all part of her thing it's all part of the kick. And also, like, they're going to use his uniform anyway, so you don't even need to steal the ID. <laughs> That's a good, better point. Much better point. <laughs> My point was actually, though, she's supposedly squeezing him to death. At no point does it actually look like that. Every single time she does this, her legs are casually around the other person. <laughs> it worries me that you know exactly what squeezing someone to death during sex looks like. <laughs> No, it's, she's barely even touching the other person. Like, Rob, there's, there's a no reason why we make him there. live in the Inland Empire. It is for <laughs> our mm-hmm. safety. For the safety of others, yeah. <laughs> so the next day, Bond sneaks on board the yacht and beats the shit out of a deckhand. <laughs> Hey, that deckhand was coming after him. He saw that reflection. and Yeah, so he discovers the, the dead body of the Admiral, which, as John mentioned, is clearly very happy. And so he grabs a boat and he speeds for the nearby destroyer. And so the lookalike in the Admiral's clothes gets aboard the destroyer. There's this big event because they're going to be revealing this brand new helicopter. Oh, boy. Here oh, boy. Go. Here we go, motherfuckers, because Nick's <laughs> about to military nerd out. <laughs> oh, boy. Guess what? In this movie, this is a real experimental helicopter that is currently an operational helicopter used by three different European countries. This was developed by Eurocopter, a division of Airbus, and it does have the EMP shielding that they claim it has. 
And it does have the stealth technology that they claim it has. This is an actual prototype that Eurocopter, because they put their logo all over this helicopter. Yes, they did. This It is called the Tiger. It is an actual helicopter. They let the production use their prototype that they were, you know, pitching to other countries in 1995. This is a military industrial complex commercial. Damn. Yeah, it literally has copper mesh wiring inside the fuselage, which uh, saves it from EMPs. And because of the materials it uses and the way it's um, constructed, it does have a reduced radar signature, which makes it count for stealth. It was first deployed in 2003, so many years after this movie was made. Wow. But you can literally see this helicopter on battlefields today. I, I have a question, though, and maybe you can answer this. So that all the sort of military brass are all gathered on this boat for a demonstration of the tiger. Yes. As far as I can tell, it just takes off and flies around. What the fuck is it demonstrating that the helicopter can fly? I don't really understand this. They mention its maneuverability, so maybe the demonstration yeah. was supposed to do some of that, but instead they've hijacked the thing, so they just fly off instead. <laughs> Yeah, they fly off of that. Also, yeah, I mean, if it's supposed to be stealthy, surely you would want them around some radars so they could kind yeah. of see that and do like a simulated EMP. Yeah, you, you, Rob, fair point. Because we don't know what the demonstration was supposed to be because they just fuck off out of there. It's still really, really cool that that was an actual helicopter and that that was that is was and is in operation. That's it is in cool. operation. Yeah, this is product placement. Like this helicopter, this plot point of the film is a giant exercise in product placement. I was very surprised this moment didn't have a like, that's not the scheduled flight pattern. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, how long do you think it was after they flew away and the helicopter <laughs> just, just, the that someone turned to someone else and went, there. so is it coming back? Or? <laughs> Also, so yeah, I mean, basically what happens is on a top unnecessarily seduces the pilots to shoot them and take their uniforms. Oh, yeah, she yeah. just does it for fun. Bye, eyebrows. Yeah, as I said in my note, a pair of eyebrows walks in with this co-pilot. <laughs> and, and apparently nobody on this ship, because they, they're, they're walking through the lower decks, apparently nobody on this ship where sound travels really easily hears these gunshots. That's just a normal thing that happens on a Tuesday on board this French destroyer. So she and the fake Admiral fly away. James Bond gets there. Not in time. Doesn't mention to anybody, hey, I'm British intelligence. Those are not the pilots. They're stealing your fucking helicopter. By the time he even gets on the boat, the helicopter has lifted off. Yeah. So what does he expect he's going to be able to do? You think he'd be able to say to somebody, hey, I'm MI6. Your helicopter just got stolen. You might want to go intercept it. The mental acuity just just isn't there. Yeah, it wasn't. It would that wouldn't have been cinematic enough. So he decided against it. He's working with the director on this one. Okay. So now we see a dog sled running through a frozen tundra. A title lets us know that this is the Space Weapons Control Center in Svernaya, Russia. And uh, we meet Natasha, who's going to be the Natalia. Natalia. Yeah. Fuck. Natalia. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I only fucked this up once in my notes, so that's hopefully going to be the only time I fuck this up. We're not going to have another Cabrini Green here. I was supposed to say Calibri. <laughs> Calibri Green. <laughs> so Natalia is talking to a voice-activated computer, which is definitely not a thing in the mid-90s. I mean, our voice commands barely work in 2021, so I don't buy this. All the computers are in English. Yes! Thank yes, you! Yes! Thank you! I had that. All Russian computers are defaulted to English. <laughs> I think this was a problem they had. They were like, how do we solve this? How do you make a blue... Fuck it. Subtitles aren't a thing. Yeah, because they all speak English to each other. Because apparently in Russian hacker land... Yep. Uh... The only Russian in this movie is Biatch. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's not even real Russian. <laughs> It's like Modern Warfare 2. The director said, no Russian. Hey, listeners, it's John this time. Sorry to interrupt you, but there was no other way to bridge the conversation gap happening at this point. See, while Jules will still be silent until the big sandwich, he originally gave the setup to introduce our next main character. That said, let me drop you back in. Boris! Boris, he is invincible! Played by Alan Cumming, because they got zero Russian actors for this movie. <laughs> Natalia <laughs> is Polish. She is not Russian, the actress. And we meet him. He sexually harasses Natalia by sending her a custom graphic of herself in a bikini. No, it's it's the girl sitting behind Natalia that she draws attention to because she's got dark hair. Because she calls her friend. She's like, hey, 
look at this. And the lady's like, he wouldn't know a fucking woman if he, if she sat on his head. <laughs> right, but I'm saying the graphic is of Natalia. She like, calls in her... I'm saying it's the other gal. Okay, we're going to have to sort this off off show. Yep. Whatever, locks her out of computer. We, we get introduced to Boris's riddle fetish on top of... These know, are the drawing. dumbest passwords. So dumb. So he says, all right, so they're right in front of you and can open very big doors. Knockers. Hey, what is the Russian for knockers? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> Bliach! And is it also slang for boobs in Russian? That's yeah. part of the question I... as well. <laughs> One of the, did not look that up. I, I was too busy looking. Because it's supposed to be these double entendre answers all the time, but I don't think that works across language. No, it's <laughs> only for English. Yeah. This movie came out after Jurassic Park, right? Because Jurassic Park yes, was yes, 94. Because I got major Dennis Nedry vibes from Boris. <laughs> Yes, I, I would agree with that. So Boris hacks into the Department of Justice, and um, it's honestly not any less easy for them to hack us these days. This just kind of predicted the next 30 years of Russian-American relations. And she asks him, like, well, what if they trace you? And Boris says, no, he's got a spike program that he uses to reveal the location of the person trying to track him. Uh, this will be important later. He also has a password for this spike program. Yeah. And he says, you sit on it, but you can't take it with you. And then he types at, on at least 12 different keys and it's a five character password. Yes, it is. <laughs> Not considered strong enough by most websites today. And having successfully left a note in the American systems, he says his catchphrase, I am invincible. And he also does that thing of narrating what he's typing while you see the typing appear on screen. Better look next time. Ha! Slughead. <laughs> Slugheads. <laughs> Forgotten about that. Alan Cumming just having the greatest time of his fucking life. So much fun with this character. He, I'm going to save it for the appropriate time, but he clearly had a lot of fun on this movie, and he has one of my favorite behind-the-scenes things. Oh, can't wait. Let's get yeah. there. And we'll get there. So Boris goes out for a cigarette, and his Zippo gets blown out by the Tiger landing, and you might want to get a refund on that because it is supposed to be the windproof lighter, and there is a lifetime guarantee. As a Zippo owner, I do know this. And so on a top and Colonel step out wearing Soviet fucking uniforms. Ooh, this is going to piss me off because they <laughs> don't get any more accurate throughout this film. This is 1995. There are no fucking hammer sickle stars on Russian uniforms in this period. Mm. Yeah, but American moviegoers don't know that. Absolutely. Oh, well, we do now. <laughs> <laughs> they do now. <laughs> also, if you're turning to James Bond and expecting historical accuracy, Nick, I've got some very bad news for you, my friend. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. They wear Soviet uniforms with the fucking thing, but then they slap on the, the, the modern Russian flag patch that is on contemporary uniforms, or at least contemporary to that time. Slug so they heads. they were aware <laughs> that there needed to be some modernization, but yeah, they 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 did not put any efforts other than sewing some patches on. So the colonel, it's Colonel Uramov and on a top, and they go inside, and the colonel pretends that it's a simulation, and he needs the major in charge to give him the golden eye and its keys. He's a general now. Yes, can we take a, a moment to appreciate the display for the voice? Um... ID print. Oh, oh with, the yes. two, with the two things <laughs> coming together, it's two waveforms. Two waveforms that join in the middle. <laughs> See, the great thing about this Russian facility is that you need to speak an English voice command <laughs> into the voice-activated <laughs> lock to get in. And there's a visual display of, apparently, your voice file and what you just said coming together and merging to match And it must up. match exactly. You have yes. to say it exactly the same way, yes. exactly the same speed. <laughs> if not, fuck you. So, Urimov... He gets the keys, he gets the golden eye, which is the thing he needs to control this satellite. Anna Top proceeds to shoot everyone in the room and looks like she's getting off while she does. Oh, yeah, she is orgasming the hell out of this. this is her and thing. the general even throws this look of the hell, lady. Yeah, he gives her a what the fuck look. <laughs> Yeah, he is disturbed by who he's working with here. <laughs> so Natalia was getting coffee, so she 
doesn't get shot, Uramov and Anatov, they activate the golden eye to destroy the station that they're currently in. And we see the satellite come out of its shell and holy shit, this is the worst Earth I've ever seen. I don't, I don't see it's no curve. Terrible. Where's that curve at? I don't see no curve. Well, at least we now know where the second dollar of the $4 CGI budget was spent. It was on the Earth. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this isn't CGI. This is clearly models. They used an out-of-focus marble for this <laughs> Earth. <laughs> it looks like it's Neptune. I'm, I'm, yeah. Canonically, I am saying that this blue, satellite is above Neptune. Patch. <laughs> Fucking hell, the Russians put a satellite around Neptune in the 90s. This is, this is next level stuff. Yep. Seriously, this satellite looks like it belongs in the original series of Star Trek. That is the level of modeling that we're talking about <laughs> here. So uh, Natalia makes a noise. On a top goes after her, but uh, not before somebody hits the alarm. And apparently the alarm, instead of sending like, you know, so Soldiers and helicopters, which would make sense. <laughs> right. Sends it's, the jets. They yeah, send scramb- jets. They scramble three MiGs to go and... and- <laughs> Now, are they actually MiGs this time? Okay, they are MiGs, okay. but they are models. They're just models. There's no ways they're going to get three MiG-29s even in post-Soviet times to fly. So these were all models, but yes, they are very accurately modeled MiG-29s. And Natalia makes it look like she's going to escape into the vents. So on the top comes in, sees the vents have been disturbed, assumes somebody's up there, and shoots the ceiling. And so when she comes back, she says, I had to ventilate someone. Ah, ah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Soromov and Anatop escape in their helicopter, and we now find ourselves in MI6. Uh, we see Money Penny in a evening gown. Ironically, Money Penny is played by an actress named Samantha Bond. That's right. And tells James that M is waiting for her. And she, you know, there's a bit of banter. There's there's always been a flirtatious relationship between Money Penny and James Bond. And the reason why she's in an evening gown is because before she got called in, she was on a date with a gentleman. And I think the fact that she had to specify that it was with a man confirms that she is in fact bisexual. Money Penny, bisexual confirmed. And why not? Why not? And so Bond flirts with her and she points out quite rightly that this behavior could qualify as sexual harassment. But she also says that one day she's going to need him to make good on his innuendo. So it's clearly the welcome kind of sexual harassment. It's the good kind. You know, this good sexual harassment, this bad sexual James harassment. James Bond is really lucky with his sexual harassment. He never runs across a woman who's like, you know what? I don't like this very much. I'm going to sue you. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be a really awful day at a- MI6 HR. <laughs> <laughs> So we get some random dude. He gets he's a named character, but this is the only scene we see him. So I'm just going to call him random dude because fuck him. Uh, tells Bond that they found the tiger, but it's in an abandoned radar station in Russia. I feel like they're trying to do a bait and switch with this guy to make you think he's the new M for some reason. Maybe because, yeah, M is. I, I, I disagree with that. He's too chummy with James. He's too familiar. He, he doesn't look he doesn't feel like an M. For yeah. And everyone knew going into it that Judy Tench was there anyway. So. Yeah. 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 So Bond mentions that, oh, so the, the state radar station you've tracked this helicopter to, uh, it's in it's in northern Russia. However, when you see the targeting <laughs> map in the radar station, it has Svernaya in the middle of Russia. And Svernaya, like the actual like location, is a northern peninsula in Russia. So he's right. The movie visually <laughs> is wrong. <laughs> God, this movie's lazy with some certain detail. That's fantastic. <laughs> so uh, the dude makes a snide remark about M, and as we say, it's one of those like, oh shit, she's right behind me. She's right behind <laughs> me moments, yep, as soon as he says it. It's how you summon her. Yeah, <laughs> you say M into the mirror five times, she comes out and tells you why her analysis is superior to your instinct. So they believe this is the base for the Gold Knight Project, but M and her, you know, number crunching ways, you know, and her analysts say that, that that project was never feasible. So clearly M came up through the analyst route, was never really a field agent, and that's kind of a point of contention between Bond and her. Yes, it is a consistent trope. Bean counters are always the bad guys. Yeah, they're nerds. Only ex- oh, The only exception is Moneyball. Mm-hmm. And you don't know what it's like out there on the streets. So they're watching the satellite feed, and I love this line because Bond asks whether the images are live, and M says, unlike the Americans, we prefer not to get our bad news from CNN. Ooh. 
I adore her as M. She's really she's good. A, she's a I just adore character. her. <laughs> yeah. She's impossible to hate. Yeah. Uh, so back in northern Russia, that's also in the middle of the country, uh, the MiGs are now at the radar station. They're flying around and everything looks normal up there. Well, no <laughs> shit. I love this. Like, what the fuck are you guys going to see? <laughs> there are several hundred feet above the base that all the bad shit happened inside. It was still there last time we checked. <laughs> right. Well, guess everything's okay. Okay, guys, we're going also, home. We have no way of seeing inside the facility, so we're just going to go ahead and assume that everything's hunky dory in there, too. Going back to why the fuck did they send jets? <laughs> <laughs> Because so we have dumb. to have the scene that's coming up. But you could have still had the scene with helicopters instead. Yeah, it's just, as Nick has said, this movie is lazy. So lazy. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So Natalia emerges from her hiding spot. Turns out the vents were just a ruse. She just hid in a, a cupboard in the kitchenette. Yeah, a little cupboard under the kettle. Yes. Yeah. And sees that the golden eye is about to fire directly on her. And again, map showing that that Svernaya is directly in the middle of the country, not in the north of the country where it actually is. Go fuck yourself, audience. The EMP goes off and she dives under the safest stairs in the history of humanity <laughs> because... No, they're concrete, man. Concrete. They're solid. And so this EMP... This is not how EMPs work, by the way. Not even a little not bit. Not even a little bit. But this is how they describe it to work. Okay. You know, with Bond and Random Dude and M, they, they talk about the EMP utterly destroying any electronic <laughs> system. Right, but, 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 but... Not just rendering it useless, not just sorting it out, utterly destroying it, and that's what fucking happens. Even monitors and screens that aren't even on... <laughs> suddenly become dangerously explosive. It's Bang. so All over. ridiculous. Yes. Ah, I love it. So, um, yeah, love so, it. so yeah, so the way that this movie treats EMPs is as if it's this microwave that comes out because we see like the entire facility engulfed in essentially Ghostbusters electricity. Oh, I was going to say Terminator time portal electricity. That too. <laughs> that was what I got as well. It looked like something out of the Terminator. And so th inside the cockpit, we see the pilots getting cooked by the EMPs and that's not how, again, not how it works. They're screaming and like bursting into flame and shit. It's just like, God. And it's awesome. <laughs> and so there's a plane that crashes into the facility. Yeah, I don't understand how one MiG was more shielded than the other two because they just exploded midair and the third one lost control and it crashed into the base. So here's the here so here's the thing. Because fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so when things settle down, Natalia tries to get out, but the voice activation computer is busted. And again, this seems really unsafe. There needs to be some sort of fail safe where your people can get outside. That is a major fire hazard. This entire building is a major fire hazard. Everything blows up. When you look at it funny. <laughs> well, part of the roof collapses and starts to come down on her. And I was like, wow, and this is where she's crushed to death. I wonder why they tried to get us to relate to this character at all for three minutes. Yeah. Yeah, very strange. But no, not doesn't happen. She... No, nah, there's a little bit of wiring that saves it from hitting her. Right. So, so she, yeah, like this, the actual dish comes in and she's able to climb the scaffolding out into Siberia. Yeah, she totally froze to yeah, death. Yeah, she she immediately got out and died of exposure. Like, yeah. guys, I have been in Moscow in the winter, and this is and that's not anywhere near as cold as Siberia. Fucking freezing. Fucking. freezing. Freezing. I have never been so cold in my life. I don't care that there's the dog sled there. She still died. She yeah. <laughs> She's dead. Dies. It's Russia. She fucking dead. So back at MI6, everyone in the operations room who's been watching this through the satellite feed deduces that it was attacked by an EMP. They know that the Soviets and the Americans were developing these kind of satellite weapons, and they link the helicopter to what just happened. By the way, during all this shit, we do see the helicopter fly away and not get affected by the EMP. And they link the stealing of the helicopter to what just happened, because it would be the perfect getaway vehicle. So they also say that it must. this must have been an inside job because you would have needed the access codes to fire the weapon. And they suspect that that crime ring in St. Petersburg is involved. And they see Natalia. Well, they see somebody come out. We know it's Natalia. They figure that if anyone's going to know who was the, the inside man, 
it's that person who's definitely about to die of exposure. Quick question about the helicopter getaway. Yes. Whose lap is Boris sitting on? That's a great question. <laughs> definitely Zinnia's. This is clearly a two-seat. <laughs> there is not a lot of space in that helicopter for another person. Yeah, definitely definitely on Anna Tops, and she's just crushing him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> As they and fly he's away. liking it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so in M's office, she and Bond are trying to figure out uh, who might have done the Golden Eye, and the uh, top person at Severnaya was a, was the you know Uvermov or Uvernov or whatever the fuck his name is, who's now a general. Uvermov, yeah. You know, more tension here between James Bond, who likes to go on instinct, but M was an analyst and she likes the numbers. Yeah, because the Russian government has like basically chalked everything up to a a training accident. Basically, she says her analysts don't think that Uramov fits the profile of a traitor. And Bond tries to pull a told you so. Are these the same analysts who said they couldn't have a golden eye? The same analyst that said the helicopter theft couldn't possibly be a threat. Bond basically straight up says that he does not like her methods. And she says, you know, something because I think. You're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War whose boyish charms, though wasted on me, obviously appealed to that young woman I sent out to evaluate you. So you know about the sexual harassment and you're not doing anything about it. Okay. Still an epic Judy Dench rant. Sexual harassment. Great at Judy Dent rant, but also, hey, uh, movie, if you know that James Bond is a sexist, misogynist dinosaur relic of the Cold War, why the fuck are you trying to reboot the franchise? Eh, he gets results. He gets results. Yeah, so basically she tasks Bond to find the Golden Eye and stop it and also tells him to not go out on any personal vendetta against Uramov, who he thinks killed Sean Bean. Yep, don't make it personal, cliche. <laughs> don't make it personal. Keep it business. You know, even though she basically just straight out called him out for being an asshole, there's like a glint of like respect and like mm -hmm. like of him in her eye as she tells him to come back alive, Bond. Hence setting up future movies and yeah, they're, they're going to have a relationship arc. So now we're in St. Petersburg, actual St. Petersburg. This is a military parade going outside of the Winter Palace. What is with the discipline of this of this military band? That's what I want. Uh, you expect discipline from the Russian military? The horns are pointed downward? What the fuck? Is this a Russian thing? Fucked if I know. I, I did not notice that. Guys playing horns, they're kind of pointed down towards the ground. No, you keep that shit out, maybe a little bit up. I've been in marching bands. <laughs> Evidently, you know, this Russian seriously? marching bands, mate. That's, that's what I'm saying. Maybe there's a cultural difference there. I don't know. So apparently uh, the Ministry of Defense is here for Russia, and no the fuck it isn't. It's in Moscow. The central seat of government of Russia has been Moscow since the Soviet time, so this is bullshit. But in this world, the Ministry of Defense is in St. Petersburg. The defense minister has called in Urimov for a meeting. Urimov says that the GoldenEye attack was done by Siberian separatists, and he tries to resign, being like, oh, I fucked up, I resign. So, But apparently the council doesn't want to let Urimov of resign and Russian ministries are run by councils? The fuck? First, he says he wants assurance that there are no more golden eyes. Don't worry, there's definitely no more golden eyes, he promises. And the defense minister asks about the two missing technicians, and Uramov is like, oh, fuck, I left a witness. Because he's like, I was only aware of Boris. Uh, and they're like, no, 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 this other chick, she crawled out and hopped a dog Yeah, sled, she wasn't man. among the dead, so... Arrived completely frozen. It was weird. <laughs> she wasn't among the dead, but we found her 15 <laughs> yeah. kilometers to the east. Frozen to death. Very sad. Frozen in the forest. The fact that they knew that and he didn't and he didn't think to check. I'm like, you, you are terrible at this villain thing. <laughs> Yeah, he's supposed to be in charge of space operations, and he is clearly spacing it. Oh! Thank you, John. Womp, womp. So now it's Q time. Yes! Yay! Desmond Llewellyn! Yep, has played Q for as long as he was physically alive. God, I miss him. He's great. He's like the grandpa you wish you had. So he rolls up in a cast, and it's like, oh, so skiing accident, Q? Psych, it's a fucking rocket launcher. <laughs> it just shoots off it. And it totally misses where it's supposed to go, because they've got all all the bags piled up in a dummy and it totally hits a desk just to the right <laughs> I can't decide if the Q department would be the best or worst place to work <laughs> your boss would be Q this is amazing. Yes, it would be the best place to work. Which would be amazing. But then you look at all the shit that's going on in the background. 
and how your life is at stake at any fucking moment. I mean, you wouldn't work there for long, but... <laughs> yeah, the decoy phone box. That has an airbag for some <laughs> reason. There's all kinds of other stuff where people are messing with something. They get blasted across the room by like an oh, air cannon or yeah. something. There's so many workman's comp claims coming out of this. There's so much slapstick happening in this office. So now this is where they make a big fuss of the BMW Z3. I'm, I got to call it a Z3 because that's what I grew up. Z3 just sounds wrong to me. Yeah. Right. All I got to say is as a result of this movie, everybody wanted this car. And they take like a solid, you know, minute describing all the stinger missiles, as we were saying earlier. And the this. Yep, and the, the missiles are behind the headlights. Doesn't play. It's not a factor in this film. Super disappointing. Yeah. Uh, also, he gets a, a belt that's got a repelling wire in it. And for some reason, the same department that gives you your gadgets also gives you your plane ticket because he, he shows off the plane ticket under an x-ray table thing. Something that, again, never comes no. up. <laughs> Here's a question. How do they decide which gadgets to give Bond for a particular mission? Like, how do they decide that a, a, what, that a belt buckle with a repelling rope might be useful on this particular mission uh, how, do they, how do they come up with that they look at a crystal ball and they get a sense of what scenarios may or may not come up on this particular mission and they give him gadgets accordingly well they blew it on this one because he never used those stinger missiles well I, I get a sense that things like the belt are suddenly now more standard issue it's not we're, we're expecting that back at the end of the mission right <laughs> But also, <laughs> we learn that he's going to get a Parker Jotter pen grenade. And I was instantly recognized this pen because, um, as I'm holding up now, I am a Jotter owner. <laughs> I own several of these pens. They're amazing. And by the way, you know, the sound effects of this movie are generally pretty awful. They get their Jotter clicky pen sound effects perfect. <laughs> yeah. Can we get an example? They, they got, got it perfect. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty that's much it. it. Yeah. You need to do that again before it explodes, though. <laughs> oh, fuck. Whew, safe. So Q demonstrates that this pen will explode. You got to click it three times to activate it. Click it three times again to deactivate it. It's got a four second fuse. And just in case anybody doesn't believe him, he blows up a dummy to demonstrate. And then they go back to a workbench and James Bond sees this really large sandwich. And as if he thinks he like it's a gadget, he picks up the sandwich and starts fucking with it. It just starts turning it around in his hands. Well, listen, if you worked in the Q department, would you try and steal anyone else's food? Fuck no. <laughs> Fuck no. Fuck no. I rest my case. There was one story, actually, about Ian Fleming and a secret agent who was in uh, in a particular country where he was suspicious of being poisoned by another agent, specifically the fruit that was delivered to his hotel room. So he uh, sent it to get tested, and they said, there's some lethal amounts of cyanide in this fruit. We suggest changing grocer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Q says, don't touch that. That's my lunch. I was going to say, yeah, Q's response is that it would blow up the way he's like, don't touch that. It's my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Tactical sandwich. Also, Jesus, Q, how, how big a sandwich are you eating for lunch, my dude? That's a, that's a full <laughs> that's on a like foot two long, foot sub. Yeah. Yeah, that, is a, that, is, yeah. <laughs> that is more than a foot long sub there. Brad, how did you make it to that old? Shaggy and Scooby would say that's excessive. <laughs> <laughs> so Bond lands in St. Petersburg and uh, American Boris Yeltsin is waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> this is his, his CIA contact and he gives him like this passphrase and the CIA guy is just like, that's fucking stupid. I'm not doing that. Let's go. <laughs> That's some Cold War shit. Get get with it. Get with the modern age, you stiff ass Brit. And Bond is just like not having it because he pulls his gun on him. How did he get a fucking gun through it in like, several international airports? Who the fuck knows? But he pulls a gun on him, and the guy's like, "All right, all right." He gives him the counter side. He's like, "No, show me your pat, your your tattoo." Did you notice the bad ADR on the "All right, all right, all right" when his lips are clearly not moving? I did oh, not yeah. see that. There's some majestic ADR between these two over the next. The few sound shots. in this movie is bad. I'm shocked. I tell you, shocked. 
ADR is wonderful, but I I like my uh, my good friend Blue Screen even better in this movie. So <laughs> so makes the CIA guy show him his ass tattoo that he got after his third wife in public. It's great. And then the weirdest line. Yeah. What is it? He asked James if he does any gardening. As in, there's a rose on my ass. Do you want to do some gardening, if you know what I mean? What, like laser removal <laughs> surgery? What, <laughs> like, what the fuck is this supposed to imply? I have no idea what's going on. We're back in on. the Department of Motor Vehicles section of the scripting. <laughs> I think it's got something to do with like the nature because it's like, you know, oh, the weather in St. Petersburg is this way, but it's such a freezing thing and say who the fuck. I think it's got maybe it's the weird. Russian bear hunts at night. Yeah, but he's super casual about it. He's like, hey, James, you do gardening. This is what we're going to talk about on our car right now is gardening, I guess. So anyway, so American Boris Yeltsin, his name is Jack Way. I'm just going to call him Jack <laughs> for the rest of the film because uh, American Boris Yeltsin's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, so Natalia arrives in St. Petersburg by train where the train announcer lady speaks in English. Naturally. Because nobody in Russia speaks Russian, apparently, in James Bond world. Cold War's over. That's they, they stopped that shit. Yeah. Is this the basis for all those like little tweets and memes of American tourists being pissed off that like they were in Italy and no one spoke English? <laughs> oh, those people are the worst. I've been to St. Petersburg. They don't speak English at the fucking train station. <laughs> So they're fixing down this Soviet-era car, which is broken down. Uh, Jack and Bond are talking a bit more about the Janus group. Nobody really knows who the guy in charge is, but maybe if they talk to some of his competition, they can get a lead. So they're going to go talk to uh, this ex-KGB officer, Zukovsky, and Bond knows him because he gave him a limp back in the day. So now we're at the local IBM yeah, store. Yeah, yeah, I was saying Natalia's secret, uh, secret messages are brought to you by IBM. Yeah, this duplicitous act of hacking is brought to you by mm. IBM. And so she pretends she's buying a bulk purchase of computers for the American and the Swedish schools. And so of what? Like, this is for the American school, one for the Swedish school, one for the Dutch school. What school? Who are you rep who are you pretending to represent here? <laughs> Americans and Swedes, damn it. Yeah, I mean, like, th there's French schools in Los Angeles. It, the, people have their foreign schools in other countries. It's, yeah, but it's, I doubt it's called the French school. There's only one in town. Like, you don't even have to mention it by name. <laughs> this is a Russia where everyone speaks English. Why is this hard to believe? <laughs> okay, okay, good point. But yeah, this is, is the most depressing computer store I've ever seen. They have, like, three monitors. There was, like, two... I think they're supposed to be scanners at the time, like on one table. And she see, she knocks on the manager's office and he comes out and she's like, is this seriously all you fucking have right now? Nobody can get more. And she can pay hard currency, which is, a, I mean, by the way, this dollars. is like, mm, dollars paying dollars. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, that's a huge thing. Like, like the post-Soviet economy was fucking awful. So that is mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, she starts listing how many computers she needs for the various schools, and like he straightened up his tie. He's like, "Holy shit, I'm gonna retire off of this one." <laughs> but she needs to see a demo model, and she needs to see mm -hmm. it alone. Um, apparently, computer with a modem hookup. Yes. Naturally. Uh, yep. Because apparently internet cafes weren't quite a thing just yet. Nah. So she's like connecting with Boris through a weird chat room. And just something I love about computers and movies, and they try and make them sound awesome, or her basic needs are a 500 meg hard drive. The 1990s, but right? But it has to be IBM compatible. Happy days. IBM compatible at the IBM store. <laughs> With a 44.1 <laughs> modem. Yes. 14.4 <laughs> modem. Yeah. Jesus. Crazy. So Boris gets an alert that says incoming email. <laughs> <laughs> it takes up the whole fucking screen to say incoming email. And by the way, so Natalia's typing on this thing, and she is typing like she's playing the piano. <laughs> like the <laughs> just like both hands simultaneously <laughs> up and down, like not moving side to side, like just like up and down in the same section, like Jesus. Acting. A acting. acting. <laughs> she gets better later, but for this one scene, it was jarring. So they're having this email exchange, which is actually a chat room where you see the other person as they're typing, like the letter. Show. This is movie chat room right here. 
I mean, this is, yeah, before people actually had home computers, you know, in great numbers. And Boris has his avatar that predicted Mr. Mackey. Oh, God, he does have Mr. Mackey. <laughs> Help a non-American Mr. Mackey. Uh, South Park character. Right, okay. He's, he's like, drugs are bad, I'm okay. Hacking the Department of Justice is bad, I'm okay. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm behind on my South Park, That's but I get right. it. Yeah, skinny guy balloon head, basically. I was yeah. behind. He was in like the first season. <laughs> Let a man not know what South Park is. Anyways, um, <laughs> so she tells Boris about Oranov. He tells her where to meet up. Yeah, yeah, meet up at Our Lady of Smolensk in one hour to meet up with her because she's not safe, you see. And she gets to the church. And there's this weird, like, spooky beat where the wind shuts the door and blows out these candles. And she runs out scared and she bumps into Boris, but also bumps into Anna Top. Uh-oh. Dun, dun, Which is dun. weird because Natalia has this look like she recognizes Famke Jansen. But... Did she she never a, saw her. I don't she think she ever saw, saw her. her no. She never saw her. And later she her. claims to have witnessed the murders and witnessed the general doing all this stuff. And she didn't. Yeah, she, she, she was in the cupboard. Oh, she, no, she, she might have, been, she might she have might seen have them before the she kitchen. went to get coffee, maybe. Maybe. She was on her way to get coffee like when they showed up. Who, who knows? She does not know who these people are. I mean... This movie is not above plot holes. We we know we know true. This. this is true. So cut to Russian Hagrid's club. <laughs> this is the Robbie Robbie Coltrane. fucking Coltrane. Robbie oh, yeah. fucking Coltrane, who's the the former KGB agent who Bond needs to talk to, and he's you know complaining about how the free market economy is going to be the end of him. So he rounds a corner and gets a gun pointed at the back of his head. James Bond snuck up on him, and he goes. Wolf or PPK, 7.65 million. He can tell by the click of the gun what it is. <laughs> He's Robbie Coltrane. He's magic. Damn right. Strictly speaking, not supposed to be doing magic, though. <laughs> understand that, don't you, Piers Brosnan? <laughs> <laughs> he gets the Hasselhoff powers. Yeah, just knows what kind of gun is being pressed against his head. By the way, 7.65 millimeter. I'm like, this is basically a fucking pea shooter. <laughs> It is, this is a tiny caliber bullet. Can we get to the casual mini driver? I was gonna say. (laughs) I was waiting for this to happen because I saw it and I was like, there is no fucking way that's mini driver. And I Googled it and it was fucking mini driver. Mini driver is playing a, like his mistress who's singing a country song horribly, by the way. And I'm just going to go ahead and ban all Russians from singing country music because you just sound (laughs) fucking awful doing it. And I know these are Russians. Mini Mini driver is having the time of her life in this movie. Loving it. Yeah. Oh yeah. So they've captured Bond at this point because somebody got the drop on him. So, huh. And they're now in the main theater room of this dinner club that Russian Hagrid owns. Bond makes fun of the singing because it is objectively terrible. Who's strangling the cat? (laughs) And fucking Robbie Coltrane pulls out a pistol, just starts shooting Bond's couch. Right in front of his crotch. Right in front of his wang. And this does not stop the singing. Apparently gunfire is just so common in this club. Mini driver (laughs) keeps singing. (laughs) She's really into that country song. Yeah. Stand by your man is what she is singing. Uh, if anyone <laughs> cares to know. So basically, Bond is like, hey, I got this business opportunity for you. And this is one of those things where they start the conversation at one location and it continues in another location because they're now in Robbie Coltrane's office. Wait, I do want to have a quick shout out to one of his cronies, Dimitri. Uh, yes. Yeah, at one okay. point during the conversation, uh, he says, you know, <laughs> do you know how cold it gets and how bad bad that is for my leg tell him dimitri and dimitri goes well it depends shut up (laughs) (laughs) i'd forgotten about that (laughs) you know dimitri is is clearly is is crony and but he wants to be honest about how cold it gets (laughs) boss i am not a yes man i will i will always tell you exactly how it is Silence! <laughs> and then I think Bond makes a fat dig really? at Robbie Coltrane. Yeah. What does he say? Oh, yes, he does because he's like, he says, Surely you must have recognized that the trick wasn't shooting you in the knee, but missing the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that as a fat dig, but yes. I was yes, like, it is. Is that a fat joke? <laughs> yeah. And as somebody who spent a winter in Russia, 
<laughs> Russians are really good, especially in the big cities, are really good at winter because literally everywhere you go that's not outside, it is heated as fuck. You are constantly like putting on layers and taking off layers. Like if you're spending any amount of time inside, your knee's fine, dude. Like chill the fuck out. Just don't go outside. So in Russian, Robbie Coltrane's office basically gives him a business opportunity that's going to make him a lot of money. Something about exchanging C4 for cash and this doesn't really matter. Uh, but what we learn here is that he doesn't really know anything about this Janus guy, except that he's Lean's Cossack who fought with the Nazis against the Soviets in World War II, tried to defect to Britain in order to help them fight communism, but they got sent back to Russia and Stalin basically killed them all women and children included. Bond is like, okay, well, meet me at the Grand Hotel when you're done with the, the business thing I told you. Well, now we got some James Bond pool time in the hotel spa. And seriously, what the scene. fuck is this 80s buddy cop music doing in my goddamn Bond <laughs> film? Like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Jesus movie. What the fuck is this entire scene doing in my Bond film? It's <laughs> so bad. Right, <laughs> all of it. So basically, Anna Top comes in in a bathrobe and initiates some fight fucking. Well, he had mentioned with Robbie Coltrane like they're supposed to meet at a hotel and I'm guessing that's where this pool is then. Yes. It's a pretty cool pool. That's a cool ass pool. This was supposed to be the meeting place for him and Janice. Right. So she knows his location, got sent to kill him instead, and she's mm -hmm. trying to do her her saffing, her her uh, thigh squeeze, the air out of James Bond thing. He defeats her with a butt burn. Yep. Drops her on the sauna fumer. And uh, she drops another biatch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, another biatch. <laughs> yeah, he pulls his gun on her. So, like, random dude comes in who's, like, not really a factor because he gets whacked over the head with a bucket and that's the end of him. So yeah, he... random goon just joins the fight and gets knocked out. <laughs> the fact that he doesn't fall downstairs is a miracle. In his tactical towel around his waist. <laughs> tactical towel. Tactical that's what towel. I'm going to call it every time I come out of the shower. It's a tactical towel. I guarantee you there is somewhere that sells a tactical towel for men. <laughs> there is a tactical baby bag that you can get oh my at a tactical God. baby holder. Is that not holder? the most overcompensating for your masculinity thing Oh, it ever. is. And it is a real thing. It is a real thing. Oh, I know. I've seen them, man. I'm yeah. surprised. It's a diaper bag, and instead of being, you know, having cutesy shit, you know, for the baby, it's camouflage. Molly webbing. Fun. And it's supposed to look like a military shit. Yeah. yeah. It is the most overcompensating thing I've ever fucking seen. When you're going into the jungle on a sniper mission, but you just couldn't find anybody to <laughs> you can get a sitter. Exactly. That's why they call face cream for men. They call it face protector. You know, oh, and if you want to get a makeup for men, it's called war paint. It's Jesus Christ. <laughs> buy what you want to buy anyways so yeah so she's yeah she's like super pissed on a top that she did not kill bond like she's like she did not get her death really sex. angry yeah she didn't get to have death sex which fucks her off so that's why she yells bleach genia druga maya slova at the bleat jesus fucking christ um i'm just calling i'm saying biatch that's all i'm saying yeah yeah if they're gonna fuck yeah. it up we're gonna push it that much further this movie originated biatch no it was around yeah it was around it's an old thing well it definitely originated bleach it brought biatch to the russians <laughs> they are very behind in trends when i was there in like 2009 they still had rollerblades it was dude vancouver still has rollerblades what are you saying say get with the 20 first century motherfucker. <laughs> as long as you skip the whole segue segment. anyway so he tells her to take him to janice and so she drives him to a soviet monument graveyard these are a thing by the way there are soviet monument graveyards except they're not this messy they're actually kind of like pretty well organized but for the movie it's much more cinematic and ominous if they just have random shit everywhere. After she's driven him there, assures him that Janice is going to be there, um, Bond smacks the back of her chair. Judo chop, I was going to say. Judo chop! The movie <laughs> wants you to think he hit her and knocked her out, but he hit totally the back of the knock, fucking chair. He hit the back of the chair, yeah. He showed that chair. <laughs> yes. And that's a very good seatbelt that she did not slump onto the horn to alert everybody that they were there. <laughs> <laughs> that's a damn good point. <laughs> so we get some spooky walking around like, ooh, someone's going to jump him. And then we hear Sean Bean's voice. What? By the way, if you watch the trailer for this movie, it gives away every single plot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's just so It's the awful. 90s. They did that. Yeah. yeah. There's even like the voiceover of now he must face his former ally <laughs> 
I think Carrie started that with just spoiling an entire movie with the trailer. Okay, but here's the thing. This is before the internet where we watched the same commercial over and over again because it's on YouTube. Back in those days, you had to make the impression on the audience while they're in the theaters and they kind of had to mm. know what the story was. So they might have forgotten a lot of those points because they're not weird watching the trailer a billion times. But yeah, I disagree. It, it definitely yeah, was a thing. Ruining plot twists. Yeah. I mean, I think it's actually a decent a decent plot twist. It's a shame. At least I thought so as a kid. Yeah. So he comes out. Hello, James. And he says, oh, you know, surprised to see me. Like, Return of your romantic music as well. What is this shitty lethargic piano music doing in my Bond movie? Like, God. Philip Glass, is that you? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and so we learn here that Sean Bean's parents were Lean's Cossacks who survived the massacre or I guess weren't sent back because he ended up in England. But anyways, his dad was really guilty that his family family survived and all his like people that he knew got massacred and so the guilt led his father to kill his mother and then himself and kept sean being alive bond is like well i'm surprised mi6 didn't catch this and didn't let you in he's like oh well they thought i was too young and wouldn't remember so no one asked you wouldn't remember your mom and dad killing themselves yeah somehow somehow not or quite the reasons that. for it. like he wouldn't have been culturally indoctrinated to the point where he would have had loyalty to the leans cossacks or the lians cossacks however you pronounce it um as we also noticed that you know he got some scars on his face i'm just trying to work this out because they fought against the germans or they fought with the germans against the russians and then after the war got sent back where stalin killed them so we're looking mid to late 40s yes when he was a child and now we're in the mid 90s <laughs> Sean Bean, I just want to say, looks really good for being like fifty something years old. <laughs> I mean, they might have they might have had him later. I think is what happened. Who knows? But yeah, Sean Bean would like to uh, ask James Bond how he got these scars because he's got a bunch of scars on the right side of his. My face. father was a drinker. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I knew you were gonna make the Joker joke. I knew it. Well, Nick said it. Up. I was like, any second now. Any Nick second set it up because Sean B does up. not actually say want to know how I got these scars. <laughs> Basically, it's because James, thinking that his buddy was dead, reduced the timer on the bombs so Sean Bean couldn't get away in time, and so the explosion fucked his face up. So he got part of his face somewhat burned. Yes. But it's still ruggedly handsome. Yes. I mean, it's going to take a little more than an explosion to ruin that face, for sure. So he he mentioned how he was going to ask James to join, but he knew that he was more loyal to the mission than his friends. And right before Bond tries to shoot him, he gets darted in the neck and gets and sedatives always work instantly always work yep. instantly and it's always. always safer not to shoot the guy who you're trying to frame for this kind of thing as opposed to no you have to do the elaborate death trap that you're not there to make sure it works of course of course right oh no this next scene so bond wakes up stra you know tied up inside the cockpit of the tiger helicopter and natalia is in the seat behind him and she's like screaming for him him to wake up and, and save her. And yeah, as we were saying, continues with the grand ch villain tradition of setting up a complicated way to kill your captives as opposed to just putting a bullet in their heads. So there's like a countdown timer. It's going to like launch the missiles from the helicopter and he manages to headbutt the rotors on. <laughs> he like slams into the co control console. <laughs> May I ask, do, do missiles do that? Can you program missile? Do you, they program <laughs> missiles to shoot? Yeah, the, that was more of the my helicopter thought. itself. Yeah, I wanted to know that as well. Like you yeah. program a target. You don't lock onto something like with the system as you're flying. You just program a target to shoot. Seems stupid. Seems like it would be difficult in the heat of battle. Yeah, so they these missiles have been given coordinates to like shoot and then loop back and blow up the helicopter with Natalia and James Bond inside it, getting rid of all the evidence of every all the stuff that's happened. But as the missile shoots, conveniently, the ejector for this helicopter is right by James Bond's head. The eject alarm goes off. <laughs> yeah, and is in English in this French helicopter. It's ridiculous. And he tries to hit this with his head several times, and he's like obviously in front of the button, like towards the camera. It is downright comical, him trying to hit this thing. <laughs> In fairness to him, he, he got darted in the next sedative. He's still probably quite groggy, like, <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, no, nah, I think he slammed his senses back when he activated the lights. <laughs> Actually, that's a good point. 
Nothing about this scene makes sense. Nothing. About- Nothing. Not a damn yeah, thing. Because first of all, helicopters do not have ejector pods. Like this is not a thing. <laughs> this is like a thing they made up for the movie. I think at this point this was a model. This was like not the actual prototype at this point. But whatever. There's an ejector pod. But it does. It does shoot off the uh, rotors when it ejects. Right? Yes. 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 It does. Yes. But not to put too fine a point on it. If you're flying and you shoot off the rotors, and only then do you eject, that helicopter is going to start tumbling. That's the idea. No? Depends yeah. on the velocity. Who the fuck knows? It's not a thing, so it doesn't matter. There's no ejector teeth <laughs> in helicopters. This is just a thing they made up for the movie. So they get out and are almost immediately captured by the Russian military. So we're going to take a quick break. Will they escape the Russian military? Will they start closing some of these goddamn plot holes in this James Bond film? Don't hold your breath on that. We'll be right back for part two of Goldeneye. Listen, we're trapped in this Russian military prison with no way out. We'll need to work together if we're going to get through this. What's your name? Natalia, pleasure to meet you. And I love you. What what are you talking about? Our lives are in danger and you don't even know me. But my name's Bond. James Bond. Now? Look, James, I know that we said we'd keep weddings small, but I really want to invite extended family. There is also great caterer my sister used, and I know we get good deal on special. I don't care about your caterers and your sisters. If we don't do something, they're going to torture us to death and use the golden eye on innocent people. There you go, always criticizing me, just like your mother. I can't believe this is happening right now. Fine, go be with your whore. See if she love you even though you always forget anniversary. Every year. I guess I'll have to save us myself. I'll find uh, find a place to use my laser watch. Oh, Jimmy. I hate it when we fight. Can we just move past this? You know what? I'm not going to escape. I'm just going to let them torture and kill us. I'm done. Oh, and I am one always being dramatic. Bojemol. I hate you. Biatch! Biatch! <laughs> <laughs> And we're back, and uh, Natalia and James Bond are taken to a dank basement, (laughs) and they're left alone for a moment, and Bond asks Natalia who she is, and asks her if she's from the the Svernaya facility, and that's in the north of Russia, but also in the middle of it, don't think about it. And By the way, I'm pretty sure it's rule one of interrogation is not to put your two interrogatees in the same room. <laughs> so it's the whole point is that they won't this have the same story. This dude does not have all day, alright? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Russian defense minister who comes in in a moment, it just has better shit to do. She denies she was a part of the whole thing, but he looks at her watch and it was frozen. He knows somehow that it was frozen by the gold and I EMP. Her watch didn't explode, by the way, which would have been in line with... (laughs) <laughs> with oh the- damn yeah <laughs> exploding watches she, like yeah. loses her right hand because her left hand yeah. <laughs> well it's just it's just the, no the watch is just mechanical so it got frozen now if it had any electric parts you know it's, it's got, got a, a little battery. battery in it the writers in this film just did not give a <laughs> shit <laughs> no they did not they did just like we don't fucking I'm care the payday here <laughs> So she, he identifies himself as British intelligence, and she's like, I don't know anything. And he's like, then let's start with what you do know. She just said she doesn't know anything, so there's that's a stupid line. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently Natalia thinks the best way to get out of this mess is by committing treason and siding with the foreign intelligence operative. I had not thought of it that way, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and basically tells him about Boris that he was the traitor at Sivanaya. And so the defense minister, as you mentioned, Julie, like he comes in and accuses Bond of having stolen the golden eye, and they start bickering like they're a bunch of fucking I love this exchange. Michigan really lays into him. How would you like to be executed? <laughs> That's his opening line. <laughs> yeah. And Bond pulls this wonderfully little charming bit of how no no one really takes the time to do a good menacing interrogation anymore. Yeah, it's, I like that too. It's That's really good. a lost art. You know? I know. <laughs> Yeah. Where's my villainous monologuing? Exactly. <laughs> oh, we're going to get, well, there's going to be plenty of it later. No, no, that's that's basically what Bond is saying. The problem is this isn't the bad guy. No, he's yeah. not the bad guy. And basically gets 
Natalia's like, all right, you know what? Fuck it. You guys are bickering like a bunch of boys with toys and tells him that it was Urimov who stole the golden eye and that there is, in fact, a second one. And then the minister's like, and you say the art of interrogation has been lost. Like, I just got you guys. Yeah, I know. I love that. It was great. That was a great little. (laughs) Yeah, he totally (laughs) planned that to happen. You see why Mishkin's my favorite character? (laughs) Nope. Well, not for long, because Urimov bursts in and starts arguing (laughs) with the minister and he picks Bond gun off the table. Apparently, like, Bond's gun has just been on the table with an arm's reach. Bond has not had handcuffs on. And loaded. And loaded, yeah. Like, doesn't have handcuffs on. They took off his handcuffs because apparently that's also great interrogation. Hey, did you guys grab the guy's gun on the way out of there? No. Did you? Ah, they'll probably be fine. It'll turn up one way or the other. Don't worry about it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, can we get to Oromov explaining out loud his plan to James Bond? Yes, so he reason? grabs the gun, kills the defense minister, kills the guard who's been standing in the room, and starts unloading the gun in, in front of Bond, unloading the Walther PPK. And he's like, yeah, I'm totally going to like frame you for, for killing the defense minister, and then I will be the hero. And just gives Bond his gun back. He takes the bullets out, but he gives Bond his gun back, which is like, you know, hey, bud, this has got, probably got sentimental value for you before I kill you. And explains that he's going to kill Bond too, as if to say... This is going to make you desperate and probably attack me and then surprised by an attack. It's a weird, it is a very weird general. Yeah, telegraphing what you're going to do, not great. So uh, I think a guard comes in and Bond knocks him out, gets his gun, but Oromov escapes and Natalia and Bond chase after him. So uh, Bond now has a, an AK. Bond mows down the guards with almost infinite ammo. He's got the infinite ammo cheat on. And I like to think that each one of these Russian guards had a family and um, a nice plot of land, and they were looking forward to retiring in 20 years. Jesus, you're sadistic. Why would you put yourself through that trauma? (laughs) (laughs) Because it's just so malicious. There's just so much slaughter that goes on here. I mean, not as much as later on. Yeah, well, we saw them. We saw them in the canteen at the at the chemical facility. So you know, obviously, these guards have lives out of just you know being fodder for <laughs> Bond to gun down. But nope, he uses his protagonist powers to avoid every single bullet while mowing down anyone he comes across. Yep. Yeah, and of course, the guards have gone to the stormtrooper school of shooting at things. Exactly. Uh, so they run into the archive because apparently this place has an archive. And Bond, like, dominoes the bookshelves to stop them from coming up onto the upper level, so they have to burst through on the lower level. Natalia drops a book, so the soldiers spot them. It is an epic drop, though, isn't it? It's not just one book. It's like a pile of books that all start flying down. It's worthy of Ghostbusters. Gunfight ensues, and I swear to God, these gun sound effects are out of fucking Goldfinger. Like, I've heard these sound effects in the Sean Connery, like that, like this ricochet sound. It's it's awful, just awful. Well, it's it's from the N sixty four games. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know the sound effects you're talking about. It's popped up in dozens and dozens of movies. I think, like in the nineties, it was kind of an action movie staple with some sound library that everyone had access to. Yes, <laughs> it's it's the Wilhelm scream of gunshots. Yeah, it, it really much. is. Yes, it is. And in the chaos, Natalia falls through the grate on the upper level walkway, and she gets captured by the soldiers. And those three were just perfectly stationed to catch her, like a cheerleader coming down from a stunt. Oh yeah. <laughs> if you've ever been to a Russian circus, you know how well trained Russians are for for things. See, like this. see, these Russian guards were straight out of the circus. They they you know working. <laughs> two jobs <laughs> to support their family retire one day i will say though that i liked the picking up of the music during this chase scene yeah the music's getting gets, better music in the movie. Gets good, it's yeah. starting to get better it's about to get great yeah. so he uses his belt repel thing to crash out a window into a tank parking lot oh not yet no 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 uh, the guard across the way sees him and has plenty of time to train his gun on him and shoot him while he's swinging in the air and well, he obviously, fall, yeah, so he falls to the first level and cracks his skull and dies in the movie. Because obviously yeah. there was yeah. no way in hell he could kick him before he flied out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance. Uh, this movie. Uh, I th- so he crashes through this window. I think Pierce Brosnan did this stunt. Pierce Brosnan did it, like, to his credit, did a lot of his own stunts. Not the bungee jump one, because it was... Epic cool. bungee jump is a bit It much, was Captain yeah. Eyebrows, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
I think he did this one. This one's a good stunt. It's man. a great stunt, really and I think good. Brosnan did it himself. Yeah. Um, I love Captain Eyebrows, though. That's my new superhero name. <laughs> so Urimov escapes in a car with Natalia, and a group of Soviet soldiers arrive. God damn it, these fucking uniforms <laughs> piss me off. Like, <laughs> literally, and, and they were with all the soldiers he just mowed down. There's literally the red shoulder boards that say CA, but that's like Russian, so like Savetskaya Armia. So the fucking soldiers. Soviet army shows up in 1995. Fuck you. (laughs) Really bothered me. It's what they could find at the surplus store. This movie pissed you off on a whole different level to the rest of us. Like this stuff didn't even register for us. For you, this must have been fucking torture. I would like a drum roll, please, before the what's coming up, though, because it is quite stupendous. Oh, this next sequence is one of my favorite. Like it is still great. I fucking love this. It's so it's good. So good. It's so it's good. ludicrous and over the top and could work with Benny Hill music. And it's still just some of the <laughs> best <laughs> bloody action sequence. <laughs> and here's the thing. So Bond gets into a tank. And so like we, we, we don't see him getting into it, but he sees a tank, gets an idea. <laughs> Natalia God, and Uramov sequence. are driving past this wall <laughs> in, in their car trying to get away. And Boom! This a fucking tank, tank plows, through. plows through, and finally, at an hour and twenty minutes into this movie, we get the goddamn James Bond music we have been craving. Finally, it's so good. Finally, In sync with the tank chase, and you just—you know what's actually good is that they keep coming up with ways that the tank could keep up with this car. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Because a tank would not be able to keep up. Yes, like the fact that it drifts. This tank is able to drift. Yes, thank you, Rob. He drifts the fucking tank. How <laughs> the fuck do you drift the tank? I actually wrote it as Tankio Drift. <laughs> <laughs> Tankio Drift. Damn it, I was going to use that line. John, you bastard, you stole it from me. Tankio Drift. Fast and the Furious Tankio Drift. <laughs> It's oh, so good. oh my god! <laughs> uh, I didn't realize this because after the tank scene, uh, World War Three started because a British espionage agent drove a tank <laughs> through a major Russian city, and <laughs> Russia wasn't gonna. <laughs> and they know it was him because his head was poking out the up. front, so they can recognize it. And no matter how much shit he destroys, no matter how much rubble falls on this tank, he is perfectly clean yes. in his suit. His hair is not messed. His suit is in perfect condition. There's no dirt on him. <laughs> and the horse. The it, horse. Oh, we'll get to the God. horse. The horse is. <laughs> we'll get to the horse. I want someone who has not seen this to think that's an actual horse at some point. <laughs> <laughs> just like an actual horse like on the on that apple cart just gets like flipped up oh under, onto the top of the tag it's like Brr. it's just looking like the fuck am i doing up here <laughs> but we have to we have to savor this because there are so many moments so many gray moments so here's the thing mo- a, mo- a lot of this chase scene was shot in st petersburg and they fucking told nobody that this was happening <laughs> This is Russia oh in the mid nineties. You think if they're gonna like set out a public service announcement? By the way, uh, if you see a T fifty five tank driving through these streets, don't fucking panic. It's a movie. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Apparently, it took four weeks to shoot, and it's worth every bloody minute. Every week. Oh, God, this shit should have won an Oscar. This should have been nominated for best picture based on God, this scene so alone. Good. So there's this chasing tank. We get obligatory or like Russian drinking because Oromov's like drinking out of a flask because he's super stressed out. And and he, oh, I hate this guy so much because he is just the worst backseat driver. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Whoever's driving this car can't get a single thing right. No, no. turn right. Take alley. Go left. Because, Back yeah, up. they contrived ways to force this uh, tank to keep up with the car. So first there's a roadblock. He ducks down the alley. And, of course, the tank pursues, smashing two buildings just to shreds as right he goes. The fuck through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was done on a back lot. It was where they where they crashes through buildings and walls. You mean they didn't do that in St. Petersburg? In historic St. Petersburg? Just... No, they did not. <laughs> huh, imagine that. And then the pursuing cars, you know, again, this is where the Benny Hill section kicks in. Two cars pursue him and then don't realize the alley's ended and charge into the river full tilt. <laughs> And here's the crazy thing. That happened. They did that in Russia. They did that in St. Petersburg. 
and people again they freaked the fuck out because they didn't realize that the 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 gate had been like replaced with fake barrier fence by the river so they see these things crash in they're like what the fuck has this happened why are so good soldiers going swimming with their jeeps fucking hell <laughs> nick what is the russian for holy fucking shit uh blit <laughs> <laughs> Holy biatch shit. <laughs> Holy biatch shit. Boja Mois. Oh my God. Um, also, during this, the, the tiny Russian car that Oromov and Natalia are in just crashes straight through concrete bollards, just doesn't do anything to the car. <laughs> it is invincible. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the tank is crushing a number of police cars and killing some poor innocent officers who were, you know, it's their last day before retirement. And, uh, you know, <laughs> they were getting too old for this shit. Know, one last call out, you know, how bad can it be? And they actually expect they're going to take on a tank. I mean, really? Yeah. <laughs> I understand pursuing maybe, but... <laughs> And so this is where we get our like analog of an apple cart moment because literally he drives the tank through a fucking Perrier truck. It's brought Perrier, to you by yeah. Perrier. This tank driving through a truck is brought to you by Perrier. Yes. And then also this is where he crashes into a statue and that was why we were talking about a horse just now. The horse <laughs> statue like lands on top of the tank and so he's driving around in this tank with this fucking giant horse statue as essentially his hood ornament it's gr amazing it's fucking amazing i love Fantastic. this movie is fabulous it's just i'm saying the, the horse is like reared up and it has a rider pointing his sword forward so they're charging it the horse has wings it's too. great oh man and then he smash he smashes it into an overhanging building and drops smacks on top of two police cars and the two police cars crash into the back of the tank magnificent yeah and he just kind of like fixes his tie and he keeps driving the tag it's amazing it's like yeah all while looking magnificent <laughs> <laughs> so cut to uh, Uramov, he's taking Natalia to a train. A train that at the front of which, it looks like Sam Eagle from the fucking Muppets. <laughs> 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 Tell me the front of that train does not look yes. like Sam Eagle yes, from the fucking does. Muppets. Yes, I was going with angular Easter Island head, but yeah. That oh, is yeah, also that valid. <laughs> uh, so on a top is there, and Bond, kind of like from a bridge that goes across the, the rail yard, he sees the train, so he's he's got a he's got an idea i want to see the journey that bond went on <laughs> i do too because he had yeah. to travel a good to distance going, to get yeah. in front of that train yeah because there's a nice long conversation that happens on the train he winds up in front of it in a tunnel did he turn around and back into it or did he get all the way to the other side of this tunnel and just timed it right for the train to approach this is a fast ass tank he clearly went around to the other side of the tunnel and drove That's all the way through i want to see this journey or at least give me like an indiana jones map <laughs> right because this train goes through towns like this train goes for a yes. ride i think yes. we need to tell the untold story of james bond and his happy little tank i think it would make a great kids book it works. <laughs> yeah so we're so we're in the, the the fancy train car which looks like it's out of wild wild west like like the train cars in wild wild west and this train car are basically identical that was my thought too, <laughs> and so yeah. we got sean b we got Oromov, we got natalia we got on a top and um, and will smith Who knew? and will smith and <laughs> kevin kleiner there it's where it's like hey are, are we supposed to be in this movie together no no okay shit well, now that's an ass whooping <laughs> <laughs> and Oromov tells bean that bond escaped and then Sean Bean sexually assaults Natalia in a very uncomfortable moment. Yeah. God, as you look, you watch it and you're like, oh my fucking God. And then we, this went over everyone's heads in the 90s. And he absolutely like, eh. implies that her and Bond have like had this long lasting relationship. Like how we share everything. <laughs> yeah. Everything. They met 45 minutes ago, dude. Yeah, seriously. And 20 minutes ago, he finally learned her name. Shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Th this gets this plot point, like this point that we're bringing up, gets even weirder just now. Yeah, because he's like, he, he's treating it like they've been together all this time. The only reason they know each other is because you put him in a helicopter together. That's the only reason they met. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> He's matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Find me so a helicopter, make it crash. <laughs> <laughs> Boo. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so now an alarm goes off because Bond is at with his tank in the tunnel just ahead. And on the top gets fucking aroused as shit at yes. the thought of Bond derailing. They're like, he's going to derail us. And just like, Jesus, lady, calm the fuck down. You're going to die. You can't get off if you're dead. Challenge accepted. Yeah, but she'll get off the whole way there. On the ride to hell. And so Sean B tells the driver to ram the tank, but Bond shoots the, the train. And then Bond fucking teleports. Yeah, I was wondering about he that. He shoots the tank, and you see him jump out of it, and he lands, like, in some brush, and you'd think right outside the tunnel. He's a good, what, one, two hundred meters down the track? The whole train passes him and then crashes into the tank? This is not going to be the only instance of teleporting in this film. There is no way he got that far. <laughs> I, I didn't notice that as much because I was mourning the death of the tank, you know, my favorite character in this movie. It's really the unsung hero of this movie. It gets split into several pieces. And also, the train driver hoots the horn as he's speeding up. As if, like, why? Are you trying to tell the <laughs> tank to get out the way? You're trying to... Ri- <laughs> Tank's gonna go, oh, I'm terribly oh, shit, sorry. Tank, tank didn't the realize way. he was on train tracks there. <laughs> and then also, after it gets shot by the tank, the brakes go off. Like... Yes! <laughs> Yes, why do the brakes get yeah. engaged if we're ramming it at full speed? And you just got shot by a tank. At this point, it's, why is this movie? <laughs> yes, this movie, why? I have a theory that the uh, train <laughs> conductor was trying to do a Tokyo train drift, just to sort of skid it out of the He didn't realize it had to stay on its tracks. <laughs> <and didn't> actually... <laughs> so Bond goes inside. He points a gun at Sean Bean and on a top. And during this whole exchange, Sean Bean lets Bond know that natalia tastes like strawberries gross and bond's like yeah i i wouldn't know that yeah what have you been doing in this trade <laughs> are you trying to make me jealous i don't know this woman <laughs> literally met her last night <laughs> i found out her name this morning Is that supposed to make me scared or <laughs> yeah. and so ormov comes in pointing a gun at natalia and he's like look i don't give a fuck about this girl go ahead and shoot her i got my gun on you i'll just kill you and kill this fucker but it was a bluff he turns around shoots or off and lets sean bean and on a top escape and then the train car locks down trapping them inside but there's a computer in there and natalia notices that boris is trying to back up his f- this compute this movie does not know how to computer like this is fucking ridiculous yeah this there's a computer that's not only hooked up to the internet it's got backdoor access to whatever computer boris is using on the other side of the fucking world but I think it's safe to say that whoever wrote the script wrote it on a typewriter. But she has to do the spike thing to find out where his computer is, even though they're already connected. R- they're connected. <laughs> but also, how does she have the spike? Because she just like tells a it types of thing like do spike. I'm assuming this is. It comes with a spike program. It's that... it's one of Boris's computers. Mm, so that's get, why yeah. they're just all linked, I guess. And they, we, she finally figures out Boris's stupid password, which is what can, can you? What do you sit on, but you can't take it with you? A chair. No, you can take a chair with you. Worst password. Yeah, worst password ever. ever. And you can take a chair with you. Yeah, it's horrible. Worst puzzle solution ever. That was a shitty solution <laughs> to that riddle. <laughs> yeah. So she manages to figure out that you know he's in Cuba. They get out. Um, Sean Bean left a bomb in there, telling him he's giving him the same six minutes that he got. Right, but Sean Bean saying this, you know, the same six minutes you gave me, like, oh, you left me to die. Da, da. Motherfucker, I thought you got shot in the head. Why wouldn't I speed up the timer if I could get out of there? Yeah, exactly. I saw you got that shot. That didn't make sense. Add it to the list, mate. And so <laughs> yeah. him and on a top escape in a helicopter that was in a, another train car. <laughs> and James Bond has to use his laser again to get out of. Yeah, now he has a laser in his watch that we never knew about. Yeah, wasn't explained by by Q. And he's able to cut through metal without any eye protection again. So they get out right before the train explodes. Outside, she tells him that, you know, I'm going with you to Cuba because I'm the only one who knows how to disarm the other golden eye. And that was apparently super sexually attracted to James Bond, despite the fact that you literally met him less than 24 hours ago, didn't know his name this morning, and your entire interactions with him have been trying to escape death. (laughs) 
<laughs> what the fuck is going on? Also, her quip about him destroying every vehicle he gets into doesn't make sense because she's only she hasn't even seen what happened to the tank. She was back in the train car with a gun to her head. Oh yeah. I mean, there's tank pieces around there. I don't know. No, but they were in the they were in the helicopter together, and that got destroyed. So okay, well maybe that one. So they are now going for a drive, and the only time we're going to see the Z three in action, they're on a Caribbean island, and a Cessna almost lands on them. Surprise airplane! For reasons <laughs> they don't see it because off camera, you know they they don't see it or hear it, but the car's them. radar alarm goes off. Even GI Joe noticed the plane hovering behind them. They had I mean, Polly. Also, maybe you wait for the plane to land, and then you drive. James Bond is the worst secret agent ever. Yeah. Uh, so it turns out that this is Jack from the CIA. We get to see uh, American Boris Yeltsin again, but he's, you know, got his tropical Hawaiian shirt on and stuff. And he got the plane from a D agent and the CIA has no knowledge of the, of the operation, but uh, the FAA and the Coast Guard do. <laughs> but Natalia has the best fucking line as the airplane's coming down to land like over in front of them. What is it with you and moving vehicles? <laughs> yeah, she's she's the audience in the movie. <laughs> yes. And so basically Jack tells them that they're so they're going to fly the Cessna into Cuba to go and take care of, you know, find try and find the 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 radar station and tells them that they're clear you're cleared on our radar at 0600. What? Just clear them on their radar. Like, why do you have to put this weird time? Whatever. I'm trying to make sense of this movie. It's stupid. (laughs) To be sneaky. No one's up at 6 a.m. And we need to make sure there's no one else flying around to actually, you know, see them with their eyes. Yeah. In Cuban airspace, no less. Right. There is not a single Cuban in this movie. There are no Cubans anywhere in this Cuban landscape. Not a Cuban to be seen. Nope. But when Jack finds out that, oh shit, she's Russian intelligence, whatever, he's like, did you check her out? And he's like, head to toe, because, you know. Double entendre. Oh, and also Jack tells him that uh, if they need backup, you know, he'll just radio him and he'll send in the Marines. Uh, Hey, motherfucker, there's an EMP satellite about to do whatever the fuck it wants. Maybe you go in with the Marines. (laughs) Maybe that's your first play and not sending some lady who's not combat trained and one British spy to try and deal with this whole fucking thing. Just throw that out there. Or maybe just CIA isn't technically there. I think that's the idea. But we'll later see the Marines have landed on the island as soon as he's finished his mission so they could have just got in with him it's stupid yeah well when you get to the end of the movie yeah that resolution was stupid again it's the conservancy of ninjutsu trope which is very prevalent throughout the bond films oh yeah a single trained agent soldier whatever is a highly effective deadly force to be reckoned with a squad of highly trained soldiers ninjas whatever are just cannon fodder for the so anyway cut to james bond looking out sorrowfully at the ocean you know he's no he's got to go kill his friend and natalia comes out i interpreted this as that car was the only thing he ever loved and now the americans <laughs> are taking it away yeah because he gave it to jack <laughs> This this entire scene felt super mm-hmm. out of place. It was like they suddenly realized, shit, we've got to develop Bond's character a little exactly, bit. Exactly, oh, yeah. We haven't done that before. Uh, we, uh, we, we haven't, haven't done do that now? for the entire franchise. What are we gonna- <laughs> We need to put some tension in this relationship between him and Natalia because she comes out looking smoking hot in a white bathing suit. She reestablishes the plot and what's happened and then gets angry at him for no reason. Yeah, gets angry at him because he does the things that she got turned on by him doing just now. He does his job. I mean, she, he's a secret agent. Like, what did she think? happens she accuses him of like you're being cold he's like it's what keeps me alive no it's what keeps you alone and then he forces himself on her so he literally just slept with you what yeah what you the guys have been banging off all the way from russia to here like what the fuck <laughs> he checks you out head to toe i mean yeah on. she's putting up some major red flags just throwing that out there. So yeah, he forces her to kiss him and then she pulls away as if she doesn't want it, but then she does want it and starts making out. Uh, cut to bedroom post sexy time and she asks him if, you know, on the trade, whether he meant it when he said he didn't care about her and he's like, oh yeah, I totally meant it. Just kidding. I didn't mean it. Lady, you hadn't known him for 12 hours at that <laughs> fucking point. Like, Jesus, this is psychotic. It's so crazy. Yeah, these scenes Scenes make no sense. The beach and the bed scene. I, I don't These know why scenes? They, honestly, from a, it's like they're from a different movie. And the weird thing is, when I saw this movie when I was a kid, I remember thinking that. I remember thinking, like, what, what is happening here? Why? I don't, I I don't understand this. I would always fast forward on the video during this. <laughs> 
everybody would always fast forward to the video because everybody subconsciously went, no. Nope. <laughs> so anyways, cut to them flying the Cessna over Isla Nublar. Uh, John Williams' Jurassic Park theme started um, playing. Um, nope, um, nope, um, I was thinking of a good movie. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, but they're flying. Well, the- Dennis Nedry is yeah. already in this yeah. movie, yeah. so I mean. Skinny Dennis Nedry. But anyways, they're flying over ostensibly Cuba, and Natalia's giving Bond, you know, directions for where to fly, and he's like, yes, sir. And she finds this hilarious hilarious even though he's done this before when she's given him orders like she said yeah he said yes sir you know kind of dismissively slash okay i'll do it yeah but now it's like they got a thing going that's our thing now you see he called me sir like peppermint patty and and, and marcy (laughs) yeah that definitely not a lesbian relationship anyways um so they're circling (laughs) over a small lake let's get to the doom fortress come on we're there because they're they're going over this small lake and they don't see anything and then they get shot down by a team america missile out front. <laughs> <laughs> comes out of the lake yeah. a missile shoots out of the lake whenever the water drains there's nowhere for a missile to have come there's from. no missile yeah. launchers i mean like you can launch and missiles from underwater but there nope. is no missile launcher and i can you can see the fucking wire that this like rocket they shot <laughs> And I would like to uh, make a very distinct point that that rocket clearly rips through the wing of the airplane. Yes, it rips through the wing of the airplane, when in reality it blows... Because from a different camera angle, that wing is intact. It's on fire, but it's intact. (laughs) For the rest of this crash sequence. Yeah. Well, I mean, what was surprising was that they crashed and died in a horrendous explosion... And, yeah, that uh, missile just ended that. blew them out of the sky. Sean Bean succeeded. It was weird. It took a dark turn here. So, yeah, they Bond drags Natalia after they crash. They drags her out of the wreckage, and they pass out. And this is where you get a good look at what Pierce Brosnan is wearing, and he looks like your dad is about to go on a photo safari. Like that That's his outfit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just... You can't I got wear my those cargo vest. I got you can't my... wear those clothes unless you have a receding hairline. I think that's the yeah. Rule. You got like a bald spot and a ponytail. I don't know, man. He pulls it off. <laughs> he does. He pulls it off. Well, I think Pierce Brosnan could pull off any outfit you can. <laughs> French made outfit on Pierce Brosnan. Yeah. Go. I'm seeing it already. <laughs> <laughs> I can never unsee that now. I can never unhear it. And I don't want to. <laughs> So now we're in Bad Guys Central Command, and I thought it was a nice touch that they went with the marble floors for this Bad Guy Doom <laughs> Fortress. It was, it was it just gave it a more homey feel, you know? Yeah. Instead of going for pure concrete. What I noticed was that inside, there was this gray old lady just wandering around with files. And I was just like, oh my god, I hope she doesn't die even if Bond blows up this obviously explosive building. She's she's dead, mate. <laughs> she's touched. I totally did not see this one. I did not see her either. That's my thing to go back and look for in the movie. You That's will my see thing to go the back little old watch. lady. She's in two yeah. cuts when he, when Trevelli goes across from uh, right. one area. I still got a few hours on the rental, so we're good. Okay. <laughs> So Sean Bean tells Boris to get the satellite ready and Boris is like, no, it's too early. I am not ready. And I was like, dude, just fucking do it. Yeah, he's he's haughty as shit. And Sean Bean's like, no, now don't give me that shit. Don't give me your sass, Boris. (laughs) Premature satellite dishiation is what I put. Uh, Okay. So I think this is an appropriate time to talk about uh, my Alan Cummings story. So this is behind the scenes. And because he did it in his costume from these scenes, he's in a you know Hawaiian shirt with a t-shirt. He's wearing these cargo shorts. And so when a- Alan Cumming was being interviewed in this outfit, he's talking about, you know, it's the nineties now. And as you can see, I'm showing a lot of leg here and, <laughs> you know, it's not just women getting, you know, objectified in this movie. It's now men. And I, I'd like to think I consider, myself the first bond boy <laughs> oh my god helen coming you know oh. what you are the first bond boy wear that title with pride <laughs> yes we'll give that to you we will give that alan coming the first bond boy confirmed there is nothing objectifying or sexy about cargo shorts and that <laughs> comes from someone who has a large <laughs> selection of them <laughs> But he's showing some ankle, and that's not necessarily common in movies. But yeah, Alan Cumming claimed to be the first Bond boy. We are fucking giving it to him. And so outside, we see definitely not a model satellite array come out of the lake. Oh, my God. And it gets dry very quick. The first part of this draining is fine. 
Yeah. But as we get towards the end, it is such obvious this footage has been reversed. <laughs> As water drains down, quote unquote, and then leaps in the air to go down the drain. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Yeah, this shit was definitely spraying up out of there. Yes, it was. One thing I also want to point out, when we see this satellite array in all its glory... And we go back and we think about all the money that was put into the bullet train, the satellite array, the staff to man this satellite array, you know, all of the mercenaries he hides to work inside the satellite array. How much is he stealing? How much, (laughs) at what point (laughs) does it seem like a ludicrous amount you're paying to get this bank robbery done? I mean, we will eventually learn that he's going to steal all the money from the Bank of England, so apparently that's a shit ton of money. That's not that much! Especially not in 1995. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, you guys were much more aware of Britain's economic situation than I was. Well, listen, there was a Bond movie recently where the big big villain's plot was to steal 60% of the water rights in Bolivia. By those standards, this is a megalomaniacal (laughs) global scheme. Uh, So Sean Bean gives Boris the golden eye amber gel. Like, like, this is... we, we didn't mention it earlier. This is what Oromov and On a Top stole. It's kind of like this. It's the amber that they found the fucking Jurassic Park <laughs> mosquitoes yeah. in cut into a like, gem shape. That's the golden eye that they need to activate the satellite. And toy keys you give to your kid when they have that little, those little pretend cars. Exactly. Yes. And when you turn them at the same time, it shoots a little laser up to the big screen. (laughs) (laughs) And in space, we see the satellite orbiting Neptune getting into position because I refuse to believe (laughs) that this fucking satellite is above Earth because they did not, there's no continents. It's just blue shit. Just blue. And so a guard, you know, has spotted Natalia and Bond and has shows Sean Bean security footage is like Sean Bean tells him to to kill him. And so Boris asks Sean Bean, uh, target coordinates. And he says, Target is London. Those aren't coordinates, dude. Like you still need to give him the coordinates for <laughs> London. So And my response was like, What, all of yeah. it? Like London is yep, fucking massive. And as far as we know, this satellite can only target like one one installation yeah, at you a can time, get one facility. Which bit of London do you want, mate? The bank where Zartan is. <laughs> <laughs> He's left all the bags there. It'll be very easy to pick. <laughs> Honestly, the, the Cobra targeting computer to find London is much more sophisticated than the one in this movie. That's true. Uh, so Boris and Sean Bean do the two key thing for the Golden Eye. And again, we see the Soviet satellite moving above Neptune. Uh, Bond and Natalia sneak inside. Bond decides to start a gunfight with a pistol against numerous guards with assault weapons because that's what's and working. wins. And wins. Well, or like wait, doesn't die wait, wait, immediately. Wait, 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 wait. wait, we've we've skipped a massive part. What do what what did we skip? Which bit do we skip? Zenya get Zenya. Her final. Oh God! Yeah, we missed we missed uh, Zenya versus Bond. Uh, no, it's not we yet. Did. No, when they wake up after the plane crash. We did not discuss this shit. Oh shit. Okay. My bad. I don't know how the fuck I skipped this because this is crazy. Okay, we we need to sidebar this. We need to discuss Zenya's <laughs> death now. <laughs> So we're back right after the crash and Bond kind of wakes up to 80s massage video music. (laughs) And a helicopter. And a lens flare. Bond, because he's a great secret agent, stands right under the rappelling rope that comes down. (laughs) And fucking Autotop slides down and fucking just straight up kicks him in the face. And so she gets on top of him to try and squeeze him to death. And in the process licks his face yep no she's getting off it's pretty on brand for her but again she is like just lightly straddling him she's not holding him with her legs she's holding him up just there between them and he's acting which is weird because when um natalia comes to help and (laughs) pimka jansen like bitch slaps her away he doesn't fall somehow it's really weird yeah (laughs) and also when she bitch slaps natalia she's like wait your turn Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mm -hmm. the way Bond gets out of this Uh is a bit odd because for some reason he decides to shoot the helicopter instead of the person. (laughs) Right, right. I guess he could get an angle. Yeah, because she grabs the Uh. gun that's strapped to her back, shoots the helicopter. The helicopter comes down. She's also not detached herself from the rappelling rope. So she gets... No, no, he... He he, he reattaches. He reattaches. Okay, I missed that. But my point is that 
that if you've got enough movement to turn the gun on the helicopter, yeah. you've got enough movement to turn the gun on the person. Yeah, his arms Come aren't on. pinned down in any way. Yes, but then we'd we'd miss on a top dying in the most confusing way I've ever <sighs> seen in a movie. I don't think she should have died. Clearly not. Yeah, she gets yanked back into like the fork of a tree, gets pinned to the tree because the helicopter pulls her into it as it crashes. And she gets pulled with such force against the tree, it breaks her back and she dies and she's just, her body is limp up in the tree. <laughs> and neither the repelling rope nor her belt snapped. Correct. No, neither of those things happened. She also didn't just get pulled up into in through the open fork of the tree. Yeah. And like Rob just said, it's a belt. It wasn't like this hard harness where her chest got compressed or anything like that she should not be dead from this i mean she should be severely wounded yeah no she'd be she'd be hurt she'd be hurt yeah. but no this is not no 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 they were just like we we have to have her like crushed to death or strangled to death or something and we can't really figure out how to do that so tree yeah but again it was a belt harness <sighs> She's not getting suffocated or crushed like that in any sort of way. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird moment in a movie full of weird moments. But Bond quips at the end of this, she always did enjoy a good squeeze. Waka waka. Waka waka. <laughs> or just shooting people in the face. She really loved that too. She you know? got off to a yeah. lot of weird things. She just got off on murder. Okay, so where did we leave off now? <laughs> back to inside yeah, back the base. inside the base, Bond is fighting off guards with assault weapons with his uh, okay. pea shooter. And this is to distract them from Natalia, who's like climbing down to get into one of the computer command centers. This is a Wait, really... Their first, their first shot, and they slide down the dish. Yeah, that was a yeah, thing. Yeah, that was a thing. Like, they're they're inside. Let's... When Alex said to kill them, they, yeah. they, 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 there were some people that shot him. They slid down the dish and got inside. Yeah. So they're inside. Bond is taking on the guards. I mean, the only reason I mention it is that I was wondering why these soldiers have helmets. What do you mean? I mean, are they expecting shrapnel? OSHA? <laughs> yeah. Workplace safety protocols? Do you want to get, get an OSHA fine from OSHA? But Jules, I mean, you're from the UK. You understand elf and safety. Well, then those helmets should be luminous. <laughs> or at least have reflective strips on them. <laughs> and high visibility jackets, you know. Yes, because you're expecting villains to stick to all the rules. <laughs> mm. So anyways, he's behind these chemical vats that are in the same room as all the sensitive computer equipment. This design of this base is really This weird. Doom Fortress is amazing. Just oh, yeah. so hazardous. Yeah, so he's behind the, these vats of this I, rocket fuel who the fuck knows and i'm just thinking the cost to maintain this doom fortress must be astronomical oh absolutely. it's cranberry <laughs> juice it's where it's their cranberry juice oh yeah the, uh, <laughs> the evil chemical is cranberry it's, it's juice. actually the lounge that's that's the lounge is right there so he puts a bomb like a, a mine, an electronic mine, onto one of the vats. Ludicrous mines reminded me of playing Goldeneye again. Those pro those proximity mines. Yeah, it's almost like they put them in the game for a reason. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Amazing. Right? And so he surrenders. And they keep beeping. It keeps beeping and nobody hears it. <laughs> Seriously, the <laughs> no one hears it and no one notices the leaking whatever fluid. Nobody does anything about this. It leaking is fluid. flooding this fucking area, and no one. Nobody does calls about the janitor. It. The little old lady wandering around. Where's she gone? Isn't this her responsibility? Yeah. Well, no, no, she's carrying files, my friend. She <laughs> realized what was happening and she got the fuck out of there. She's the only one with the brain. Yeah, she was like, "Oh, mm -mm. I don't get paid enough for this shit." <laughs> I see where this is going, man. We got protagonists showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Always look for signs of protagonist. She's been through enough shit. That's why she's the old lady. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Natalia gets into like one of the computer command centers and computers the shit out of it. Sean Bean now strips Bond of his gadgets and tells the men to go find Natalia and inadvertently disarms the bomb that James Bond set up on the vat upstairs because I no, I would not no, say No, I think that was intentional. Yeah. What do you mean? Because he's like, oh, I still press this one, right? And like earlier in the statue graveyard, he's like, come on, man. I've anticipated your every move. I know how you think. I know how you operate. Oh, so he, okay. he intentionally does. What did strike yeah. me, though, was he seemed impressed that the watch had a new model. Because he's holding James's and looks at his own wrist. He's like, hmm, new model. 
Biatch, it's been almost 10 years. This watch <laughs> comparison is brought to you by Omega. Omega, it you is. can't afford this. <laughs> <laughs> so we learned we learned his plan now his bad guy plan because instead of just shooting him he ordered his guards to kill him they brought him to him these guards suck <laughs> like he should be yeah. dead already <laughs> he should be dead he should be dead a million times over at this yeah point. they had one job but then sean bean instead of being like oh fuck well now that you're here <laughs> um he decides nope i've got a bad guy monologue i'm gonna let you know everything mm-hmm. so basically what he's gonna do is they're gonna hack into the bank of england they're gonna steal all the money and then and they're going to use the gold knight to EMP it, stop any record of any transactions. That's not how transactions work. There's still plenty of other evidence about where it went. Yeah, to which I said there's a record of the transaction on the receiving end, too. Also, this is 1995. Paper is still a thing. Yeah. More importantly. <laughs> a lot of paper is still a thing. It's not just about that. It's it's about... Um, fuck you, England. Yeah, fuck you, England. And clearly, you know, preying on the fears of an audience, this movie is, um, you know, about a, a world that is moving online and that a lot of people don't understand. James Bond accuses Sean Bean of being nothing more than a petty criminal, and this really busts Sean Bean's borscht. He does not like that comparison. Uh, so Natalia is captured in the computer room that had just had nothing but glass around it. I can't believe it took them <laughs> this long to find her. <laughs> We've already established these gods suck. I'm not surprised in the least. She was squatting down. <laughs> in the brightly lit, fully glass surrounded room. Yes. <laughs> so as they drag her out, she manages to push a button and encrypt this shit. Um, and continues to bad guy monologue, Sean Bean does. He says not just about the money, it's about sending a message. Message. <laughs> Everything bad. God damn it. <laughs> And, but but Rob, you mentioned like none of this matters because there's still massive amounts of paper records in 1990. Because yes. he says, oh, it's going to wipe out land title deeds. It's going to you know wipe out the stock exchange. It's going to wipe. Basically, it's going to set Britain back to the Stone Age. I don't know, man. I feel like these things have backups in multiple locations. Mm. They'll figure it out. It's not as cool a plan as you think. Yeah, it's like in 95, most people didn't even have an email address. Like, I'm pretty sure things will continue right. as normal. Can we get to Boris's bright reaction to seeing Natalia? Yes. Natalia! <laughs> so happy to see her, and she immediately starts fucking pummeling him. <laughs> she dashes across the room and extends to him an absolutely amazing backhand slap. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. She puts her all into this thing. Oh, oh God, it was beautiful. Just... It's amazing. But I just, I just wonder what Boris was thinking that made him so think that she'd be happy to see him because that's the reaction. <laughs> yes, it's easy. I am invincible. I sexually right? harassed you at work for years. Why aren't we buds? And I tried to kill you. I lured you into your kidnapping yeah. situation. Yeah. But hey, great to see you. What have you been up to? I know it's been like days. How have you been? Oh, uh, that's enough time to forgive me, right? <laughs> But Boris is not happy about that. Not happy about his... It- no, now he has turned. You never do that again. Pointing the pen grenade. Yeah, so he, I, I don't know how he gets it. He, it, just, it just, again, things just teleport in this world because now... Well, he- I think the idea is he fell on the area where Trevelyan had put his yeah. effects. Yeah, when she bitch slapped him. He just picks up the pen as a part of it's it. a thing. And he's, he's got a nervous habit with pens. Now this, I have to say, the pen suspense scene is one of the best parts of this. Movie I am so life. goddamn jealous. It's pretty dope. As mentioned before, when other characters have done this sort of thing, of being able to twirl it through your fingers like that. I like learned you, that Nick, after he's this doing movie. It, Nick's doing it yep. right now. You mean, you, yeah, Nick's doing it right now. <laughs> the prick. I've never had that dexterity, man. I've never... No. Hang on, hang on. I, Let me see. Nope, nope. No. I ain't got it. Got to use my thumb. See, I was that ah. I was the kid who like would take the five rand coin in class, and I would like do the the put the coin through with my fingers. Oh, you were one of I those. I was that guy. I was that okay. weirdo who had poor social yeah. skills. I knew, I knew, I knew yeah. people like you. So he's twirling the pen, and he's like doing the three clicks because that's his tick. And yeah, there's this great moment. Of- it's a wonderful suspense sequence. And James yeah. is just waiting for that three click. Right. But yeah, it's after he discovers that she's going to burn up the satellite. He's sort of up. He's up on himself and he says, I can break her codes and then do it. He gives her some shit first because it's like, yeah. oh, she was in the guidance program. She's level two. Like anyone knows what the fuck level two programmer means. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's but- he a four or five? And yeah, what's a what good level? 
level of programmer in your metrics. Like, we have no frame of reference here. Then he finds out that she changed the codes and the satellite's going to crash into the atmosphere. Yeah, she, he thought she was harmless because she didn't have access to the weapon codes, but what she did was she changed the guidance, right. the shit she knows how to do, and then locked him out. Exactly. I can break her codes. But that's the whole suspenseful scene, is that while he's trying to break her codes, he's flicking the pen he's doing through the his fingers and, yeah. and clicking, yeah. and click, click, click. then clicking to disarm, and then clicking to arm again, and it's this wonderful back and forth, and Trevelyan threatens her by aiming his gun at James, she calls his bluff shoot yeah. him he means nothing to yeah me. it gets turned back on him huh how the turntables but yeah another another really great sequence so this is where shit gets fucky and again teleportation exists in this world because boris can't break the code so he gets frustrated and he like holds the pen up in front of uh, natalia after he's clearly armed it like give me code and bond slaps the pen away grabs natalia dives onto the floor and as much as i love alan cummings epic pen twirling skills the aim on this slap was just incredible because it the was, pen managed it? just to land above them where all the <laughs> dangerous shit has been spilling out yeah where the vats <laughs> yeah. are because the vats are not on the ground level and also went through the glass that was in the front of this area because this area is cordoned <laughs> off by glass so it teleports all the way upstairs to where the vats are explodes we cut back to the explosion but you see the explosion happen in front of the computer room where they are. So this is a teleporting <laughs> pen explosion that's going on here. It's That was a hell of a slap. And wouldn't uh, his mission have been accomplished if that grenade just blew up and killed Boris, Natalia, and Trevelyan? Oh yeah, he should have just made it a suicide mission. Yeah, he should have just dived, no, he should have just dived away and let the pen do Actually, its work. Actually, uh, I remember that happening. It was a dark ending to the movie, but uh, <laughs> it was very unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they screened that for focus groups and we're like, mm, people didn't like that one yeah, so much. Where's the sequel going to come from? And so this explosion, it fucking just sets off a bunch of explosions in this room. Talia and Bond manage to escape in the confusion into an elevator. A lot of people get killed. Computers going all over the place. That little old lady died. No, no, no. She fucked off already. Remember? She, yeah, she saw this she, coming. She's <laughs> She saw the signs and they opened up her eyes. So. <laughs> Lo siento, no señor, lo siento. <laughs> she was the only actual Cuban. She's like, uh-uh, I -uh, know this shit. <laughs> and so Natalia in the elevator tells Bond that Boris could possibly break his code, so they're going to need to destroy the transmitter on this antenna. So Natalia plays dead when they get to the top to lure a soldier in for Bond to knock out. Bond takes the assault rifle, gives her the pistol and says, do you know how to use this? To which she definitely like checks the magazine, puts it in, loads the pistol. And it's like, hey, that would have been super good to know <laughs> before we start. We could have gotten you your own gun before we started. That's how she got yeah. to level two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she leveled up. Yeah. Oh, like, why didn't you ask for your own gun if you if you know what to it do? It made absolutely no sense why a programmer would have gun training but soviet russia <laughs> thank you rob <laughs> because That's soviet true. russia so tells her to stay out of sight while he runs across the satellite back in the flaming control room boris you know sean bean learns from boris that he's got essentially one minute before the golden eye burns up in the atmosphere he's got to break this code and fix the the re-entry and Sean Bean tells a guard to watch Boris and to kill him if he moves. And we all know that people do their best work with a literal gun to their head, right? It's just, it's mm -hmm. good management. Mm -hmm. Clearly you haven't worked in Hollywood for long enough. <laughs> I have not. Uh, so Sean Bean goes after Bond in a rickety sky trip. Sean Bean goes on a gondola ride. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A sky gondola that goes from the bottom to the top. It's <laughs> oof, This did not look safe. Not even a little bit. But they're both double O, so they both have the ability to not get shot by machine gun fire. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and in space, we see the satellite already re-entering Neptune's atmosphere. And starting to burn. Yeah, yeah. so which means it's yeah. already too late. Well, I mean, in all fairness, when they first bring up how far away it is and up in the atmosphere, I think it was 100 kilometers, that was already burning up. <laughs> that, that satellite had burned up long before <laughs> this moment. Oh no, something is inaccurate in the I know. 
Uh, so there's a bit of a brief shootout between Sean Bean and James Bond as he comes up, approaches the top of the the gondola <laughs> sky tram. And, and James Bond's gun actually runs out of bullets. And so does Sean Bean's. And Sean Bean whips out his pistol because, as we all know, it's a lot quicker to switch to pistol than it is to reload. Yes, this is yep. true. This is very true. But it's cool because pretty soon we're going slappers only. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Slappers only. So he gets up and he starts shooting at James Bond with his pistol. And uh, again, the reload on this pistol pissed me off because it's a semi-automatic pistol. Ah. When, when you finish with the magazine, the action remains back at the back and you can just put in a magazine, sl- you know, release the action and you're good to go. You don't need to pull the action back to reload it. Like, it's not how pistols yes, work. Yes, you do. Because movie. Ah. Exactly. Now you remember that speech from uh, Phone Booth and he says, why does he, why does yeah. he already have it cocked? Because that sound is scary. So Boris has now broken Natalia's code and is now going to reposition the satellite to uh, get the satellite af- out of um, orbit, even though it's clearly in the Earth's atmosphere and it's too late. Don't think about it. I thought it was at Neptune. Yeah, Neptune. However, in the middle of fighting with Sean Bean, James Bond jams something into the the mechanism that you know moves the satellite and stops. Put a big fat skeptical pin in this, by the way. Oh yes, this this <laughs> yeah, has unintended. What the fuck? Yeah, this has unintended consequence. This is unexpected consequences. <laughs> So inside another, like, there's all these, like, indoor spaces on this antenna array that they're they're on. And another indoor space, Sean Bean gets the drop on Bond, and they start their climax fight. And honestly, this fight wasn't that bad. I re- I thought it was good. It was, it was very kinetic. Good. I actually yeah, very much good. enjoyed it. Yeah, I had a note here. Oh, look at that. A really good fight scene where you can actually see clearly what happens. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. No shaky cam in 95. No, no, yeah. No mm. complaints. Enjoy that fight scene. And however, Sean B manages to get the pistol and shoots Bond in the head. And finally, he doesn't bad guy monologue because he's learned his lesson. No, I can go fuck myself because he continues to bad guy monologue. Um, and so James Bond takes this time to kick a trap door for under him he somehow knew that this was how this you know is this point where i noticed uh how many times james bond gets away by kicking or pressing something slightly off camera or headbutting it it's always just that switch off camera that we don't see that's his that's his superpower hit something off camera it's what they teach you at Brit- british spy school so yeah this opens like a trap door below him and it sends this really long ladder down the center and allows him to escape and god sean bean just gets stupid here he gets very stupid here he calls for a helicopter gunship to come take him out instead of waiting for the helicopter gunship to easily shoot james bond off this ladder he's like no i gotta go down there and take care of this myself i'm an <laughs> or idiot. you could get on the ladder like just at the top and start shaking yeah, there are so many things he could have done. So many nope, options. Nope, you got to go down there. Or at least just wait for him to climb up. He's got to waste all that energy. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. Where else is he going to go? Yeah, he's got literally nowhere else to go. <laughs> Close the door and lock it. Jesus. But I actually give credit that he's finally trying to kill him. It's enough, enough of this waiting around. I mean, he's doing a pretty shitty job of it. Yeah, it's such a Boromir way to go about it. Yeah. Anyways, he climbs on the ladder. So he goes down, you know, they fight on the ladder, and they eventually end up on this, like, su- like circular platform, very small circular platform at the very, very bottom. And the way that when they fall that James is kind of holding on to the cable, all I could think of is, this is the moment where Sean Bean reveals that he is, in fact, his father. <laughs> 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 I know what you mean. It had the same feel. Yep. And Pierce Brosnan says, that's not true. That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> it is very. Well, we already know Sean Bean is like 50 years uh, old yes, and was alive see? in like World War II. So, you know, it's, it makes total sense. I also want to bring up the quick cuts we get back to Boris as the satellites burning up because it goes back to him. And first it's like when he f- sees there's a jam in the dish, he, he does this brilliant whimper. <laughs> and then the second time we see him clattering the monitor and shouting speak, speak to, to me, me! Speak to and me! i was like the perfect representation of my reaction every time i get spotty signal on my cell phone or lose internet in my house right? speak to me i will shake you until you work 
<laughs> okay, so we're on the circular platform, and they're fighting there, and Bond manages to kick Sean Bean off of him, and Sean Bean is about to fly off and just fall to his death. And then catches him. <laughs> he catches him, and he only catches him so he can drop him. Like, he literally, like, looks yes. at him, gives him his death stare, and... That's actually good, though. That's good. Because that makes it his choice, as opposed to an accident. It's not, it's not an accident. He would have purposely kicked him off. Because up until that point, he was conflicted? Like Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing when we were fighting to the death, and I kicked you off of the platform. <laughs> Those bullets I shot at you... Were with love. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Jules. I can't agree with you on this. No, one. no, just the active fact that you know he could save him or he could he kill actively him. kicked him the first time. That was a pretty active kick. <laughs> well, just to get him off him, right? First kick was to actively get him off. He's in his own way giving him the middle finger because he went against advice and made it personal. So yeah, he's he's holding Sean Bean's leg as he dangles off, and he says, "For England, James." So this is like kind of like they're saying before they start a mission. He's like, "For England, James," and he's like, "For England, Alec." Like like that's what they say before yeah. a mission. So one last time, he says, "For England, James," and he says, "No, for me." And he drops yep, him. Made it personal. And he falls like 300 fucking feet through the air and does not turn into human jam when he falls at the bottom. I thought that as well. And is conscious. In a very non-Sean Bean action, does not die. Again, for the second time this movie. <laughs> But you're right, Rob, he doesn't die. He's still conscious. He's just like broke his back or something. I mean, he's not going to be, he's not going to be getting up and playing football anytime soon, but yeah, he's alive. Now we have the unbelievable, unbelievably ludicrous moment where Natalia steals a helicopter. No. Oh. The dish decides to self-destruct for no reason because it's got a small jam. Hang on, we're, we're not quite there. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Because we learned that Natalia has hijacked the helicopter gunship that was supposed to come and take James Bond out. She got into the back seat and pointed her pistol at the pilot's head. So this allows James Bond to grab onto one of the landing skids and fly away from the antenna. In a combination of good stunt and my good friend blue screen. <laughs> depending on if it's Pierce Brosnan or not in the shot. But why the hell does the entire dish self-destruct because it's got a tiny jam? Because movie. <laughs> because movie. I'm pretty sure it's in the contract This is somewhere. the pin that we put into the, him jamming it into the mechanism. This apparently sets off like a thermonuclear explosion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a chain reaction where this entire facility just starts to go. Everything is explosive in this movie. It doesn't make any sense. And if it was going to have this reaction, surely James Bond's primary plan would have been just sneak in, shove something in the mechanism, get the fuck out, and enjoy your Mai Tais while this thing explodes behind you. Yeah, problem solved. But then you don't get any monologuing. You need the monologuing. Or, or, you found the satellite dish, call in the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is also something that could be done. Or we could go in with two of us, one of whom is not remotely trained. <laughs> At least that's what you think, but goddamn, she can handle a pistol and hijack a helicopter, so. Apparently. And she never even uses the damn pistol. And so the antenna, because of this explosion that happened for definitely logical reasons, it comes crashing down on Sean Bean, who's alive to be crushed. I mean, I will say this is probably Sean Bean's most epic death. Pretty it's good one. Pretty, it's, it's up there, for sure. Sean Bean has to die, it is tradition. And he's he's had some epic ways to go. And so it crashes through, like, the half sphere at the bottom in the ground. That's like the satellite part of this antenna. Yeah, array. there's this lovely cut between Sean Bean screaming as he gets crushed and then the ceiling collapsing and Alan coming screaming at the satellite burning. Up. Yeah, because the control room is like right under this satellite array and it just misses Alan coming. He just stands up and yells, Yes! I am invincible! And then it's a 90s movie, so liquid nitrogen death. <laughs> Like, out of just yeah, fucking gets... nowhere. <laughs> well, we saw the tanks earlier, but yeah, there's apparently liquid nitrogen tanks in this control room with very delicate computer equipment. Don't think about it. <laughs> yeah, why does a satellite facility need liquid nitrogen? What the fuck are you guys it's doing It's a now, 90s man? movie, and Terminator 2 had happened, so you gotta have your liquid nitrogen. True. Yeah, so he gets flash frozen with the liquid nitrogen, and this is definitely not a statue of Alan Cumming, we swear. <laughs> they had no Alan Alan Cumming statue budget. You always have Alan Cumming statue budget. You should have Alan Cumming statue budget, but this, not a great one. So the helicopter drops Bond and Natalia off in the 
the middle of nowhere. And they just, like, let him go or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the helicopter just fucks off. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, they didn't think it might be useful to escape an island run by a hostile government, you know. Gee, if only we had a helicopter right now. <laughs> God, we could escape this <laughs> island with, you know, the place that has mm. the communist government that hates well, at least your government. But don't worry, it's cool because there's no one around, so we can totally make out now. No, they're gonna, they're gonna fuck. They're gonna fuck in the middle Damn of this jungle. Right, they are, because there's no one around for 25 miles at least, except American Boris Yeltsin. Hey, Jimbo. <laughs> This time in camo. Yeah, he's there. Without him being called on the radio. Yeah, just knows where to be. He just decided to show up. He knew exactly where the helicopter was going to drop him. I think he communicated with the helicopter pilot. They didn't have the headsets on. They didn't know what was going on. He told the helicopter pilot where to drop him. How? He's that good. <laughs> it's the CIA. They can do yeah. stuff. It's the Marines. Denzel would have figured this shit out. I'm just saying. He already has a field of Marines <laughs> waiting. But he's just like in regular camo mm -hmm. and he's talking to Bond and Natalia and he's like, all right, Marines, let's go. And there's like 20 Marines who are like in like the extra camouflage that makes them really blend into the bushes, stand up, why they were doing that, who the fuck knows. Why they stayed settled while they were boning is another question. They're very good at following orders, but here's what I don't understand. They're very well camouflaged. It's, it's great. It's great work. There's also three surprise helicopters that show up when he calls for Marines. How are helicopters unnoticed? Off camera. I don't Off know. Off camera. Yeah, exactly. It's the power of not being in frame. They too are stealth helicopters. They still make noise. They still displace large amounts of air. How the fuck are helicopters a surprise? I, this movie's dumb. And it's almost over, thank God, because the, the helicopters land. James Bond sweeps Natalia off her feet, takes her to the helicopters. And she's like, no, I'm not getting in another vehicle with you. And he's like, oh, trust me. And maybe you two want to debrief each other at Guantanamo, huh? And I was just yeah. thinking, oh, that's the most romantic sight I can think of. Mm -hmm. As they fly away the helicopters, we get the same song that is at the end of every fucking mid 90s movie. It's just the keyboard music with like the soft voiced male vocalist oh god it's playing. so awful isn't it we had the great so tina turner bad. song at the start what the fuck it's not like they didn't have the material well might i remind you that they started the movie with this kind of lounge lizard porno version of the james bond theme so they were like well we got to go out the same way <laughs> yep all right, and that was Goldeneye. And before we go, as millennials, we know that every movie and TV show has a moral. So, Jules, what did you learn today? I learned that everywhere around you, even in the smallest object, if it's got a circuit, it can blow up. <laughs> And John, what did you learn? I learned that a tank can drift, goddammit. <laughs> Hell yeah! Yeah, boy! <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Rob, did you learn anything? Yeah, any the chance? music directors in the 90s were high as fuck. <laughs> 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 and I learned there was no reason for me to learn Russian when I went to Russia. I fucking put way too much effort into that. <laughs> oh, Nick, don't be a biatch. <laughs> oh, biatch. Oh, my God. Oh. Uh... <laughs> oh, and before we go, uh, we need to say what we're doing next time. John, what do the folks at home have to look forward to? Next up is 1991's The Addams Family. Oh, good movie. Do, 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 do. And do you have a review? Not a lot that were very fun, just a bunch of saying they liked it and, you know, kind of this and that. Did find this odd one. An entertaining movie for the masses, so I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 that's the review Like Someone wrote those words The first line is, there's two more lines Wow An entertaining movie for the masses, so I don't like it The plot is simple, the humor also Yes, the costumes and makeup are interesting God, that just sounds like teenage me Ugh <laughs> All right. Well, with that to look forward to, Rob, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, hopefully, you know, we're going to just ruin your childhood one movie at a time. <laughs> thank you so much for having me, guys. As always, this was a, this was a fucking blast. Nice one. Always a pleasure.
And for uh, for the folks at home, where where can they find you? All right, so uh, I write books under the name of Jackson Ford. Uh, they are just as fucking strange as this podcast. They're a delight. Uh, you can find them online at jacksonfordauthor.com um, or I'm on Twitter and Instagram uh, at Real Jackson Ford. Awesome, and we will have links to all of that in the show notes. And that's our show. If you liked it, please subscribe. If you loved it, please share it with all your friends. And whether you liked it or loved it, we'd appreciate it if you gave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts to help others find us. Also, be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. Links to both of those are in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Millennial Rewind.